All right, thank you, Scott. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, first meeting of the Edina City Council in 2021. It is January 5th, 2021. We have bid adieu to our former council members, Mary Brindle and Mike Fisher, although Mary has joined us this evening to see the uh, video of the swearing-in ceremony. So, Mary, welcome. Uh, for those of you that are tuning in, this meeting, of course, is being held electronically to comply with the governor's stay safe MN order and to ensure the safety of all residents and our staff. All members of the city council, staff and presenters are participating from their homes or their offices. Before we begin, there's a few things to cover for those listening in and hoping to, hoping to participate in portions of the meeting. The city is uh, committed to continuing to receive and hear your input on matters. We've been collecting public input through our council correspondence web form, voicemail, and our engagement website, bettertogetheredina.org. It's important for all of you to know that all comments that have been submitted have been received and read prior to the start of this meeting. You don't need to submit anything further in the way of information to us uh, in any other way. Information is being considered equally regardless of the way that it was submitted. So tonight, there'll be two times that you can call in to provide comment via phone. The first is during community comment, uh, that portion of the agenda, you are allowed to speak about anything that is not on tonight's agenda or scheduled for a future public hearing. So just uh, again, for folks that might be interested in the public hearing that we're having tonight, uh, you should be aware that you should not be calling in on public on community comment to testify in that public hearing matter. For those of you that are, as I said, that are interested in talking to the council about something of concern to you that's not on the agenda tonight or scheduled for a future public hearing, you're more than welcome to speak. You'll have three minutes to uh, speak. The call-in number is 800-374-0221. The conference ID is 607-3924, 607-3924. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Our city manager, Scott Neal, will be the timekeeper and he'll let you know if you go over the three minute mark and he may forewarn you at about the 30 second mark so you can think about wrapping up your comments and um, remember uh, you do not need to call in tonight if you've already provided information <clears throat> to the council on a matter of concern to you um, and then there is a public hearing as I mentioned earlier tonight uh, residents will have an opportunity to participate this evening uh, and remember, we're not going to act on these public hearing matters that we're handling in the virtual world uh, for uh, a couple weeks. You know, we usually there's that two week lag time and we'll handle it at the next council meeting. And the public hearing on the public hearing matter we have this evening will remain open until noon on Wednesday, January 13th. So you could submit uh, uh, initial information or supplemental information uh, by leaving a voicemail with your feedback at 952. 8260377 or submit a comment online at our website bettertogetheredina.org so thanks in advance for your patience we've got almost 20 people participating in these meetings from different locations using different technologies we're going to do our best to keep everybody uh, that needs to be involved in the meeting from a council standpoint uh, uh, connected into the meeting and now uh, let me call the meeting to order and ask our our uh, city clerk, Sharon Allison, to call roll. Councilmember Anderson? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Here. Councilmember Pierce? Here. Councilmember Stoughton? Here. Mayor Hovland? Here. Uh, next, we're going to, you might be wondering, folks that are listening in, uh, Councilmember Jackson and Councilmember Pierce, uh, why they were answering in that manner. Uh, they were sworn in yesterday. And now we're going to turn to that uh, administration uh, of oath information, and we're going to turn to our city manager, Scott Neal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Denfeld uh, to roll some of the photos from yesterday's event. So yesterday, a small group of city staff, newly elected and reelected city officials and their families met in the city council chambers to conduct a solemn oath swearing ceremony to affirm the great promise of democracy. The reins of local government leadership were transfer transferred peacefully to a new group of Edina residents selected by the people of this great city in the 2020 general election. The city of Edina elected officials 
promise to faithfully discharge the duties of the office of city council member to the best of their judgment and ability. We are indeed fortunate in Edina to have residents willing to sacrifice their personal time and energy to serve their fellow residents as their elected leaders on the Edina City Council. The power we have in city government to continue elected leadership from one election to another is both a right and a privilege passed to us from the federal and state governments, which is why our elected officials also swear an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Minnesota. On behalf of the women and men who carry out the will and decisions of the Edina City Council, I want to thank our new council members, Carolyn Jackson and James Pierce, for joining our city council and also thank the mayor for his continuous dedicated leadership to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Scott Neal, for those comments. Uh, I'm going to turn now to uh, Carolyn Jackson and James Pierce as our newest city council members uh, and ask uh, uh, council member Jackson to comment first uh, with respect to anything she'd like to share with her fellow uh, colleagues, uh, new colleagues, and also the community as a whole. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was an election about managing change, and we're in a time where we've got people moving into the metropolitan areas, we've got climate change, and we've got just structural change, specifically uh, thinking about transportation um, and how we're gonna get around in the future. And Scott asked us to think about our, uh, Manager Neal, about our hopes and dreams. And my hopes and dreams are about the opportunities that this gives us all to think about, you know, how can we have a more inclusive community? How can we be good environmental stewards? And how can we leave the future with some innovation um, and, and the opportunities to do that? And I'm just thrilled. I'm honored to have been elected uh, by the people of Edina and I'm excited about the opportunities that we face. Thank you. Thank you. Member Jackson, uh, Council Member Pierce. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am beyond excited to be sitting in my living room in a city council <laughs> meeting. Um, I'm really excited about working with um, each and every one of you. Um, I'm excited to represent the community. Um, I have to say, I, I haven't seen photos of myself from that angle before, and I see more gray hair than I <laughs> than I would have expected. Uh, but I am really thrilled. Um, I was asked to to write um, an essay for a publication that I did an interview for, and I talked about three things. Um, one, I talked about racial equity and how important um, that is for our nation. Um, I talked about socioeconomic equality um, and how we see with how relevant the pandemic has, has really surfaced some of the issues that we have with socioeconomic equality. And then I talked about climate change. And so my hope for um, my being on the council is that I can impact change, not only in those three areas, but just make living in Edina better and more exciting for everyone. So again, thank you for so supporting me um, and I look forward to supporting you. Thank you, Council Member Pierce. Uh, and, and for me, Manager Neal, thanks for uh, that opportunity for uh, our council members and me to express uh, to our colleagues and our fellow residents uh, uh, some of our, our, our thoughts and emotions around for me being reelected, for uh, Carolyn and James being elected for the first time we, we live in such a great town uh, and it keeps getting better. And, and I feel like I've had the privilege to be part of what we've worked on and built together in Edina. People love our town. Uh, the 2019 survey determined 98% of all residents characterize their lives in Edina as excellent or good. Uh, there's so many things to be excited about, but most of all, it's about people. The people in our town are so considerate, so kind, so caring. We've seen a lot of that during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we've also got outstanding financial health. Edina recently had its double AAA bond rating renewed by Moody's and Standard Poor's for the 20th consecutive year. And for the 13th consecutive year, Edina has received a certificate of excellence in financial reporting. You know, for all of us, we want to make sure that we preserve all that we love about Edina, but we also recognize that we need to be uh, continuing to think for and plan for the future while dealing with the issues of our time. You know, over the past year, we've had... Uh, 
We've been through a lot together, especially since March, uh, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, the civil unrest next door in Minneapolis and its potential spillover effect for Edina. The issue of whether to create a masking policy that our council was in favor of backed by our citizens on a nine to one basis. And most recently, the appropriateness of artwork at uh, Edina, by Edina High School students at 50th and Prince dealing with racial injustice uh, that uh, had such a tremendous uh, sub, a level of support in our community. There's always challenges ahead and more good work to be done to build an even better place for all of us to live. And I'm honored to be part of this work and I look forward to working uh, with our existing council members, with our past council members as they continue to provide input on issues that are important. And, and really excited about, as James Pierce said, having both of them here with us now uh, to share in this work of moving our town forward to the next level. Uh, you can't rest on your laurels. We got to keep moving. We got to keep pushing ahead. Uh, we got to be the town we all dream it should be. And uh, we'll all work hard to make that happen. Thank you very much. All right, now, um, next thing is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I will rise for the pledge. I think there will be a, a flag that comes on the screen. Would you please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We've got a form of meeting agenda in front of us this evening. And is there anyone who wishes to uh, modify the agenda uh, in any form or fashion? Otherwise, we'll entertain a motion to adopt the uh, Meeting agenda. So moved. All right, moved by Member Pierce, moved a second by Member Jackson that we adopt the agenda as shown. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, Ms. Allison. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovlin. Aye. The meeting agenda in the form published is approved. Uh, next, we're going to turn to community comment, and we're going to hear from residents, as I mentioned earlier, who want to talk to the council about something that's of concern to them that's not on the agenda this evening and not scheduled for a future public hearing. Again, uh, call in at 800-374-0221. Conference ID is 607-3924. Uh, an operator will ask for your name and street address, put you in the queue to speak. I think you have to uh, uh, manage that by pressing star one. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Uh, Director Benarat will bring you in before the council. And so, Director Benarat, do we have anybody who's waiting to speak to the council about a matter of concern to them? Good evening, Mayor Hovland, members of the council. I do have a few people on our call already this evening, but currently I have no one in the queue to speak. As a reminder to those on the line, to get into the queue to speak, I need you to press the star or asterisk key on your telephone keypad, followed by the number one. Uh, that's star one. That will indicate that you'd like to speak. Um, with that, I do have um, one participant ready to talk with you. Um, operator, will you please unmute the line of Mr. Richard, I think the last name is pronounced Teamer. Um, and Richard, once your light has been open, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Go ahead, Mr. Teamer. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Okay, my name is Richard. Thank you. My name is Richard Thiem, uh, not Teamer, and I right. live at 65, I live at 6566 France Avenue South, uh, Unit 404 in Edina, and I I'm thanking you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Point of France and our association. Mr. Theme, them. Mr. Theme, excuse yes. me. Are you calling in about the public hearing matter on 6600, 6800 France? I sure am. That's what I was told to do as soon as this was available. Yes. No, no, this is the community comment portion of the agenda. You may not have heard me earlier, but there's two opportunities for people to talk tonight. The community comment portion is designed for that uh, for those folks that want to talk to us about something that's not on tonight's agenda or scheduled for a future public hearing. Since that matter is scheduled tonight for a public hearing, we're going to have a public hearing on that in a few minutes. So you should hold your comments uh, and stay on the line, stay on standby there until we get to that public hearing matter. 
All right. Now, since I've been disconnected several times by you guys, I need to know, do I have to press star one again? And if so, when? Director Benarat? Yes, sir. You will need to press star one again um, when we get to that public hearing portion. So I just wait for you to tell me to do it. I want to be sure because I couldn't get in last time. Mr. Thiem, what, uh, what do we have for you for a phone number? 414-704. I don't, I don't think sorry, we should who, get that on the air. No. I'll, I have it on my end. Yeah. All right. Okay. We don't have to have you divulge your phone number, Mr. Thiem. No. We'll, we'll try to reach out okay. to you if there's a problem. If we don't hear you coming back on the line for that public hearing matter, then we'll reach out to you. Okay. Hope we're not past midnight again. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Director Benarat, thanks for cutting me off there. Um, do you want to uh, let me know whether there's, and let the council know whether there's anybody else on the line for community comment? Yes. I, I don't show anyone else in the queue at this time. Again, we do have some other people on the line, um, perhaps like um, Richard, who are ready to speak for the public hearing. Oh, I have I have someone who's queued up. Operator, will you please unmute the line of Ms. Janet Katui? Uh, Janet, once your line is open, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Good evening, Ms. Katui. Good evening, Mr. Mayor Hovland. Uh, my name is Janet Katui. My address is 7201 York Avenue South, apartment 519. Edina, Minnesota, 55435. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Uh, I'm going to start my comments by quoting Martin Luther King Jr., who we will be celebrating his birthday next week. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. I am calling today to address Council Member Jackson um, she and I were both candidates for the council race. Um, this was a nonpartisan race, but uh, the entire time the chair of the Senate DFL party, Senate District 49, worked on your campaign. And without any of your objections, you allowed her to go because it benefited your goal. And I, who actually also served on that Senate district as outreach officer, was bullied and forced to resign as outreach officer because it presented a wrong image for the Senate chair to support you at, and not support me as one of her outreach officers. I understand that was a competition and the best person won, but you representing all constituency presents challenge for me personally, because when it is convenient, you're going to silence me and act on other people's interests. So I am um, speaking today based on the bullying that I experienced by the chair who worked on your campaign. Not sure if you were aware of it. However, I am drawing attention to that to make sure that when it comes to inclusivity, I believe that is becoming a fashionable term to be used, but it is not in a very meaningful way. And I do attest to the way I was treated uh, during that campaign. Uh, so I, I, I speak to that because um, even during the campaign, there are other elected officials who had said they would support me, but the moment you came on, I was the remaining. easiest one to expense. So 30 seconds remaining. Um, I'm speaking from when you're in a position of power, you ought to ask yourself, is it safe? Is it expediency? Vanity asks, is it popular? But the conscious asks, is it right? And that is what I hope that I can ask and expect of my elected officials to be guided by what is right, not what is expedient Time or popular. Expired. Thank you. Members, 
viewers, I do not have anyone else in the queue at this point. As you might recall, there is a slight delay with the broadcast um, for those watching on Facebook Live or television. So I would recommend we wait a minute or so before moving on in the agenda. Um, my clock shows that it is 7.22 p.m. I will let you know when it's 7.23 or when I have someone else in the queue to speak, whichever comes first. All right. Thank you, Director Benarod. It is now 7.23 and I do not have anyone else in the queue, so I think it's safe for you to move on with your agenda. Thank you, Director Benarat. Um, as is our practice, uh, following community comment, the city manager responds to community comments that were made uh, at the prior meeting. And city manager, Neil, uh, do you have anything to respond to from the prior meeting? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I do not. We did not have any comments uh, under community comment at the previous council meeting on December 15th. That was my recollection as well. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next uh, thing on our agenda is the potential adoption of the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the council who wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing nothing, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as shown? So moved. And Anderson moves. We have a second. Member Jackson seconds. Uh, any further discussion with respect to the adoption of the consent agenda? Roll call, please, with respect to potential adoption of the items on the consent agenda. Kirk Allison. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Council Member Pierce? Aye. Council Member Staunton? Aye. Mayor Hovland? Aye. The items on the consent agenda are approved. Uh, just a couple of quick observations. I wanted to, um, we've got some uh, board and commission interviews coming up, but we have some folks that uh, express an interest in continuing to serve uh, part of the reappointment process. And, um, I think I could go through those names quickly and thank them for agreeing to serve again. Art and Culture Commission, Hannah Klein and Peggy Martin, Community Health Commission, Tracy Nelson and Julie Sellis, Board of Appeal and Equalization, Ed Craycraft, Construction Board of Appeals, Wayne Dvorak, Energy and Environment Commission, nobody there uh, uh, being reappointed, Human Rights and Relations Commission, Mark Felton, uh, Heritage Preservation Commission, Mark Hasenstab, uh, Rachel Pollock, and Annie Schilling, Park and Rec Commission, Matthew Doskotch, and Rick Itis, Planning Commission, Ian Nemiroff, uh, Ian Nemiroff, and Jerry Strauss, and then the Transportation Commission, Kirk Johnson and Matt Shearer. Thank you to everybody that uh, is serving on those respective boards and commissions. We really appreciate the service and thank you for your desire to continuing to serve. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, Resolution 2020-10 deals with accepting donations. We had some really nice donations to the city uh, in this last uh, reporting period. Um, Jay Patrick and Linda Smith, uh, generous gift uh, for general use uh, to the police department. Uh, NC Little Hospice, a uh, gift of $1,500 to the police department for general use. Uh, and then from the Crime Prevention Fund, and Member Staunton may wish to talk about this, uh, six, some significant gifts uh, from them to the police department for bike patrol expenses, foot patrol expenses, and retired canine expenses. Member Staunton, was there anything you wanted to comment about there? Nothing to add, but uh, it continues to do great work. Yes, and th those uh, those contributions, I think in total, it, it came close to $10,000. Uh, 
Uh, and then the fire department got a donation from Anderson Windows of some first, uh, face shields for first responders. And then the Park and Rec Department got a wonderful donation from Bruce Moody and his wife of $3,200 uh, as a bench donation. I'm assuming it was for his dad. Uh, and then Joanne Kiefer, a nice uh, tree donation there. And then Carolyn Schrader, a donation to the Art Center uh, in memory of Sharon uh, Stu Hale, who used to uh, uh, be part of that uh, organization. So thanks to all those folks for your generosity to those various city organizations. Um, we don't have um, any awards or presentations this evening. Uh, we have one public hearing matter and we're going to go to going to move on to that at this particular time. Uh, and Director Teague is going to make a, a city presentation that'll take about uh, 20 minutes. And I think we've got about a 20 minute presentation from the uh, applicant uh, led by Andy McIntosh and uh, of McGough Development and Victor uh, Chatty from uh, HGA Architects. Excuse me, I forgot to turn my cell phone off. Um, Okay, uh, Director Teague. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. If I may share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. Uh, so this, uh, the site that we're looking at this evening is located in the Greater Southdale District. It's straight west of the Southdale Center itself, known as the Southdale Office Center site. Just under 22 acres, there's a series of office buildings, uh, the Tavern and France Restaurant, and the Bank of America. The applicant is proposing to redevelop the site. The two taller office buildings would remain, as would the Bank of America. Back in 2017, the city approved a rezoning of this site to planned unit development. And with planned unit developments, there's an overall development plan that's attached to the ordinance uh, to that specific zoning. What you're looking at on the screen is the approved plan that went with that rezoning. None of this development happened, with the exception of the Bank of America to the south. Uh, <clears throat> To refresh the council's memory and, and for our two um, new members, um, when this plan was approved, we didn't have the design experience guidelines formalized yet. We had a series of design principles that we applied to the site. We didn't have the Southdale district plan developed. At that time, uh, we thought that this plan on the screen did do a nice job of, of addressing those those principles that were established at that time. Some of the main features included the north-south lunar that went through the site to connect from the north to the south. There was a couple of east-west connections through the site, again with a lunar that shared pedestrian and vehicle street. The maximum height of that approved plan was an eight-story residential development on the south side. There would be a new six-story office building in the middle a new medical building, six stories on the north end, and then along France, a series of retail buildings, including a four-story hotel and a new tavern on France. So this plan was enough to justify that new PUD uh, rezoning from the previous zoning that was planned office district. This plan allowed a doubling of the density of the site. What the applicant is proposing tonight is to redo the plan, so it's a new overall development plan, so it's essentially a rezoning. So we take a look at those PUD principles again to justify that increase in density. So again, the site is zoned recent unit development. The underlying uh, district was planned office district. The site has, I mentioned the six story buildings that were approved and an eight story office. The underlying uh, building height overlay district is four stories. So through that PUD, some additional height uh, was granted. The site is guided in the comprehensive plan for office residential use. So the proposed uses are consistent with the comprehensive plan. 
and the density that's contemplated here is well within the up to 75 units an acre range that's within the comprehensive plan. This again, it's a large site, almost 22 acres, and there's the density because it's just one property is about 12 units per acre, so well within the comprehensive plan. So there's no amendment to the comprehensive plan that's requested with this project. There is, however, as I mentioned, the rezoning. So this is, is the uh, public discretion that has been provided um, by our city attorney that, that highlights when the city has discretion to approve or deny a project. So this falls in the green. It's that zoning amendment or rezoning. So the city has, has discretion whether to approve or deny this request. So the specific request is a nine-story office building that would be located in the center of the site, a new four-story medical building for the south end, a new, uh, uh, new Tavern on France restaurant, a water treatment plant, three above-grade parking structures, and we'll see the site plan here in a minute, and a 13-story apartment building along with a six-story apartment building uh, that wraps one of the parking ramps. Uh, public parking would be available within the north ramp, part of the get to get principles that's proposed here. Um, and the applicant is pledging to meet the city's affordable housing policy within the, the, the project. Uh, should the council approve the project in a couple of weeks, um, when they come back for final approval at that time, uh, we would have a specific, whether the units are in the building um, or just exactly how they would meet the the affordable housing policy, but the applicant does pledge to meet that policy. Uh, they did go through a sketch plan um, late last year. This is a look at the sketch plan, and they've outlined a number of changes that were highlighted within the staff report. I'll just point out a, a couple or a few. The, the office building that was planned for the middle has been rotated. Um, the purpose of the rotation is so the long angle of the building doesn't face the Cornelia neighborhood to the west. I thought it would have less of an impact to the neighborhood. The public safety or the potential fire station has been removed. And this north parking ramp has been lined with an apartment building, a liner building to help screen that parking ramp. So this is a look at the proposed plan. This is the nine-story office. You can see how it's been rotated. Liner building around the parking ramp to help uh, screen that parking ramp. And again, you can see the, the uh, public safety building has been removed. The applicant provided a shadow study. You can see there is minimal impact to the single family neighborhood to the north. There may be some impacts to the uh, buildings to the north, the Point of France building in the winter, in the winter time. So I won't go through the, the specifics of the buildings, rather just quickly, this is the 13-story tower on the north end of the building. This is the new nine-story building proposed, new retail, the medical facility. This is a look to the south, toward Southdale. This is that liner building apartment that would help screen the, the parking. 13-story tower again, new office building with the parking ramp the existing building and then you can see the parking ramp to the south so this is a look on valley view road as you're looking south from 66 so this is that liner building i want to highlight this um the height of the building here this is five stories facing the cornelia neighborhood and uh, valley view road here within the design experience guidelines we talk about this being a transition area um, to the neighborhood, and we talk about, and I'll show a graphic in a minute, but we talk about three stories and 36 feet in height. So they've done a nice job in screening the parking ramp, but it is a little bit taller than, than what was suggested in those design experience guidelines. Um, a few renderings here of the, of the project. Again, this is Valley View Road. You can see the, the sidewalks and the landscaping. The 13-story tower looking from uh, Point of France more uh, renderings of the public space that would be provided within the site. So this request requ uh, requires consideration of an environmental assessment worksheet. This project, due to the size and density, um, triggers the need for an EAW. An EAW is a look 
a study of whether an environmental impact statement is needed. The city hired Kimley Horn to provide that EAW. This is at the expense of the developer. Uh, we have with us this evening Ashley Payne from Kimley Horn, and she will go through as part of the staff presentation the detail on the EAW. And again, there's the rezoning of the site uh, to amend that PUD and a revised overall development plan. So the specific requests, there's three resolutions that the council would be asked to take action on in, again in two weeks. A decision on the environmental impact statement um, that there would not be a need for one. The second is the preliminary rezoning, um, preliminary overall development plan that would change out that previous, um, that previous approval. And then preliminary site plan for the middle parking ramp, the office building and that retail. Uh, building. That's the first phase of the development. And there would be a first reading of an ordinance amendment to revise that PUD zoning district. So just a, another quick review of the site plan. Um, Boulevard style sidewalks proposed all around the perimeter of the site, a big improvement over existing conditions today. Um, all setbacks would be met. There are 50-foot setback proposed along France to meet, again, city code, 30 feet along 66. Valley View, there is uh, the, the potential water treatment plant and the southerly parking ramp uh, does encroach into that 30 foot setback. So some flexibility is requested there. A parking and traffic study was done by SPAC Consulting. Mike SPAC is on the call with us this evening and he'll talk a little bit about the traffic. Uh, but the conclusion is the uh, existing roadways can be supported, um, can support this project and the required parking uh, also supports the project. The study concludes that there's about 850 to 1500 parking stalls in excess of what's needed. Again, the applicant is proposing district parking within that northerly parking ramp. as part of their give to get to help try to justify that PUD. Southdale plan talks about providing district parking um, potentially um, increased density within the neighborhood. So that, again, that's part of the give to get that's proposed here. So in terms of city code requirements, they actually exceed what's required by city code in terms of the parking. Uh, the landscaping far exceeds our minimum requirements. They've done a nice job providing landscaping um, around and throughout the site. A uh, question about building materials. So our new ordinance, that came from the design experience guidelines requires stone, at least um, in that first, the ground level, 60 feet up, and then 75% transparency through the building. The uh, proposed restaurant does not meet those provisions. So one of the conditions of approval would be that um, that all of the buildings do meet, um, do meet those new uh, building material and transparency requirements. Addition, in addition to the flexibility that's requested for the setbacks for the water treatment plant, flexibility would again be requested to allow the 13-story building and the nine-story building, again, over what was approved in the original PUD and within that underlying height overlay district. The uh, max density that would be allowed in a planned office district is 0.5 in terms of floor area ratio area ratio, which is the allowed square footage within the development within the site, and the applicant is requesting, similar to the previous request, to essentially double that density. So the two primary consideration, primary issues for consideration for the council is the proposal reasonable to justify the PUD rezoning, and should an environmental impact statement be required for the proposed projects. Um, so first, to begin with the PUD, uh, both staff and the Planning Commission don't believe that the PUD, there is PUD justification here. The Planning Commission reviewed this back in November, and their recommendation to the City Council is to deny the request for rezoning, and their vote, their vote was 7 to 0. Um, so we don't believe that, they, that the proposal adequately addresses the Greater Southdale Design Experience Guidelines. But some of the issues is the, the blocking of that north-south pedestrian and vehicular connection through the site where that building has been turned. Again, the previous plan had that nice pedestrian and vehicular connection through the middle of the site. 
In addition to the east-west connections, um, the height along Valley View Road and the location of the three parking ramps, again, where I talked about the height as being a, con a concern. So this is a graphic from the design experience guidelines. So this is the transition that's, that's contemplated here as, um, as part of that plan. So the single family residential area, this would be the Cornelia neighborhood, the neighborhood street. Um, Valley View Road, so you can see they're contemplating a, a three-story or 36-foot uh, maximum for that transition. So again, we don't believe that there's that they meet the PUD criteria to justify that increase in density. Uh, it's a less creative site plan compared to the approved plan, not quite as pedestrian friendly compared to the approved plan. Um, and again, uh, so those gaps in the design experience guidelines. Another thing to point out within the 2040 comprehensive plan, the plan suggests vertical mixed uses should be encouraged and maybe required on larger sites. So again, this is a 17 acre site and this isn't, there aren't really vertical uh, mixed uses proposed here. There's a mixture of uses, but they're all uh, separate, um, separate buildings. Also, we talk about in the comprehensive plan that edge or transition uses, um, the potentially providing um, medium density housing in those transition areas from single family residential into our uh, more densely developed area. So the, the, the plan lacks that as well. So the second consideration um, is in regard to the EAW and should an environmental impact statement be required. So with that, I will turn it over to Ashley Payne from Kimley Horn, who will uh, talk about the EAW. Ashley? Thank you, Director T. Welcome, Ms. Payne. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we thought it might be helpful to go through, since we have a couple new council members, um, we kind of gave this presentation at the last city council meeting or on December 1st for the another project, but we thought it might be helpful since we have a couple new city council members to kind of go through the EAW process. Um, so what is an EAW? An EAW is a brief document designed to lay out the basic facts of a project. Um, the EAW form consists of 20 questions and is published by the Environmental Quality Board or the EQB. So the purpose of an EAW is to inform the public about the project. It provides information on future permitting and approvals. It also helps identify potential impacts and mitigation strategies. And the EAW does not approve or deny a project. It's a source of information to guide other approvals and permitting decisions by the various entities. So that's the city, um, the state, the county, uh, the different um, agencies. So the EAW process is a Minnesota state specific process as outlined in state statute and Minnesota rules 4410. The EAW is completed by the responsible government unit or the RGU, which in this case, um, the RGU is the city of Edina. And so the, the RGU is designated um, by Minnesota rules 4410 or in the state statute. And this project uh, that meet the criteria outlined in Minnesota rules 4410, 4300 are required to complete an EAW. So that's the mandatory categories um, for an EAW. So as mentioned before, the EAW form has about 20 questions that cover different topics. Some of the topics covered in the EAW consist of land use, water resources, which includes um, surface water, storm water, um, you know, wetlands, granted there aren't really any other surface waters or wetlands on this site, but um, also is covered in that document. Uh, contamination and hazardous materials, habitat and endangered species along with wildlife, um, water and sewer infrastructure, transportation, air and noise, and then also cumulative. So for this project, um, it a mandatory EAW was identified um, for a mixed use development. So uh, given the size of the proposed project, it um, exceeded the threshold for an EAW. So an EAW was completed. Um, Kinley Horn completed the EAW on behalf of the city and it was noticed in the EQB monitor and posted to the city's website for a 30 day public comment period from November 2nd to December 2nd. And so the, the city received um, a few agency comments um, from state agencies and then also one other um, 
public agency or one other agency um, also provided comments. Um, they received the comments. The comments um, will be responded to, and then also a findings, the facts, and conclusions will be developed. And then the city will make the determination on the need for an EIS. So with that, maybe if um, I believe I saw Mike's back on the call, Mike, if you could talk a little bit about the transportation or the, the uh, traffic and parking studies that was done yeah. and how it relates to the EAW as well. Thank you, Carrie. Good night, Mayor and Council members. Uh, so we went through a standard traffic impact study process. Uh, we looked at Valley View 66th, France Avenue and 69th around the site, the roadway corridors, as well as all of the key intersections around the site. And we analyzed all the way out to a 2040 forecasted scenario with the development fully built and operational. And uh, we did our capacity analysis to determine would we need to add turn lanes, traffic signals, would we need to widen out roads, uh, update signal timing, uh, all the different things in our toolbox to improve traffic flow. And through that process, uh, we started with 2016 and 2017 traffic volumes before COVID. That was what was available. We also collected volumes in 2020 in the fall uh, and found that traffic in the area around France Avenue is down between 30 and 40 percent uh, from pandemic numbers to pre-COVID traffic numbers. We based our long-term forecasts per Hennepin County's uh, preferences on taking the pre-COVID traffic volume, so the higher ones, and then layering on our forecasts of the development. So we're looking at a conservative analysis. And with that conservative analysis, we found we needed one improvement. Uh, we need, instead of a single left turn lane coming out at the southern access onto France, uh, we need two left turn lanes to make sure that the stacking within the site isn't too excessive. Um, so really a change in the site plan. Uh, is recommended. Uh, we also looked at parking numbers and we have quite a range of forecasts. We looked at both national uh, parking demand standards as well as local uh, parking demand numbers that we have collected here in the Twin Cities over the last few years. And we find that the site, we're expecting, I wish we could tighten up the range, but we're expecting this site at a peak to need 1,300 to 2,000 parking stalls. Uh, as Kerry mentioned, uh, the developers are proposing over 2,800 stalls, which does meet city code requirements of about 2,800 stalls. Uh, so the proposed development does meet city code, although we think there will be extra parking on site. Um, yeah, I, that's the quick wrap up, Kerry. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Ashley. So in conclusion on the EAW, we believe that an EIS is not needed, that some of these mitigation requirements would be handled uh, through the conditions of approval, requiring some of the the, uh, the traffic improvements that, that Mike has mentioned in his staff report, as well as some of the, the uh, how stormwater is going to be handled. So basically, the conditions of approval, we believe, um, address the issues raised out of the EA, the EAW. But again, the council would take action on that um, in two weeks. So our recommendation this evening is for the city council to hold the public hearing this evening, um, hold the public hearing open until Wednesday, January 13th at noon, and then to take action on the project to uh, January 20th. So with that, we will stop there and answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you. Council members, uh, questions for Director Teague or uh, Ms. Payne or Mr. Spack? Yes, Council Member Jackson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to start with Mr. Spack. In the report that was included in our packet, there was some discussion of the traffic on 66th Street, and I had a hard time um, deciphering the engineering language. Could you sort of talk a little bit about what you found, um, how this will impact the traffic back up on um, 66th Street, especially during rush hour? 
Yeah, uh, during rush hour, we expect it to have little impact. Uh, since the site is primarily office building, uh, those folks are going to be trying to get out of the area quickly. And uh, the primary accesses are out there on France Avenue. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question I had was I wanted to, and I don't know, um, uh, Mr. Teague, if you're the guy to ask about this, but just sort of, I wanted to talk publicly a little bit about the siting of the water treatment facility and why this is a good location for that. And then also a little bit about um, why the fire station idea was dropped um, along the way and, and the need for that. But if we could go to the, just talk about why this is a good place for the water treatment facility. Yeah, Council Member Jackson, I can take that. Thank you. Question. So when we did our water uh, treatment plant study, we we looked at where's the location that's most needed, and it's in the southeast portion of town, south southeast. So we had five sites that we looked at, came to the conclusion that the one of the really best site of those five was underneath the water water tower, south of the water tower. Started some architectural pieces and had some challenges to meet the the needs of the council with the architectural stuff. The developer then was going through their projects here and, and offered to maybe provide some space for a treatment plant. So we put the project on hold and that's the concept you see in front of us today. So there's a list of 10 or 12 items that engineering has concerns with, but we think we can work through if the project gets approved. So the location they show it, we can make it work. I think there's just a lot of items that we have to figure out from a, a coordination and technical standpoint to make it work. Okay, but this is a good site for where the water lines are and everything. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you very much. Um, and then with the fire station, um, is it, it, the decision that we make in two weeks, will that um, impact future discussions about a fire station or, you know, it was in the one in the site or the sketch plan, but not now. And I guess, does this preclude that um, from being part of this development? Um, and if so, why was it dropped? Does so that make sense? Yeah, so that might be a question for the applicant to address in terms of why they, they pulled it out of okay. the project. The, in terms of both the fire station and the water treatment plant, it's the applicant trying to provide that the public benefit to the project to justify the, the increase in density. So okay. they were looking for a water treatment plant and we're trying to locate a fire station somewhere you know in this general area so it was their offering of the site um, to help out the city in that regard okay well terrific those are my questions thank you so much member Sutton well, I thought I saw your screen light up there for a second well I just had a question for mr. Spack if I could sure um, Mr. Speck, you mentioned the, um, the the parking capacity, and you referred in the report to the expected parking demand from ITE data, and then from local data, and those numbers seem to be pretty significantly different. Can you just give us a little handle on why the differences in those two? Yeah, the Institute of Transportation Engineers database is nationwide collected by traffic engineers all around the country. And the database includes data that is more than 20 years old up until current. Our data set uh, then is collected in the last five years and we submit it to ITE, but it's put into their broader data set. Uh, but we found locally in the Twin Cities that parking demands here in the Twin Cities are lower than other places nationwide uh, for similar and, developments. And just to summarize, for that local data, you you anticipated a need of 1,552 stalls, and the project is proposing, is it 2,800 stalls? Uh, the project, I believe, is proposing 2,800. I'm, I'm a little tangled up. I believe the latest analysis we did, and Carrie can correct me, but I believe they brought in a slightly smaller site plan since the original traffic study. We did further analysis that we did uh, submit to planning and engineering and our lowest number with that smaller, less dense site plan was 1,330 parking stalls. Okay, so it's got- Demand based on local data. 
So in the neighborhood of 1,500 excess stalls. Yeah, roughly double uh, okay. what we anticipate at the peak. And, and I understand that that's what our code requires, but mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Spack, Ms. Payne, or Director Teague at this point in time? Director Teague, I've got a couple of questions, and uh, but maybe I'll start with Mr. Spack, too. You know, one of the concerns that uh, some of the residents have raised that live across the street at Point of France is that they have a difficult time right now uh, getting out of their building during rush hour. And... Um, you know, they've got what I would deem to be, a, in, in this day and age, a fairly unique situation where they can come out of their ramp on the south side of their building, and it's not set up where they have to turn right. They can go across the median and then kind of be in that median area for some safety protection and then then go to the left. Um is that an unusual? Would that is that an unusual circumstance? Or you know, if that were building were built today, would we? Would be would we see that kind of a configuration, or would it be just a right out only configuration? I think based on our current current work over the last couple of years, that would just be a right out, and so that the city uh, certainly could look towards blocking that left out during rush hour or physically twenty four hours a day. Um, but you're correct; I, I don't think we would see that left out permitted with a new building proposal. All right. The other thing I've noticed from having my office over in that area is um, uh, that eastbound 66th Street during rush hour, people tend to queue up in a way where they absorb all of the left turn uh, lane heading into or heading northbound France. Is that what you're talking about in terms of adding an additional left turn lane? No, I'm talking the additional left turn lane is actually within the site. So on there's a okay. driveway kind of by Tavern on France uh, that comes out at a signal. Right. And that's where we believe a second left turn lane is needed. All right. And it, what, what, what was your analysis of the, the situation I just described? Uh, it's, you can't queue up enough cars in that left turn lane. Yeah, and the, the whole area is busy, uh, but it does operate within the level of service standards, the traffic engineering standards. So we didn't flag it as a problem in our analysis. Okay. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt Council Member Anderson or Council Member Pierce if they had some questions also. Gentlemen, did you have any questions for staff or consultants at this point in time? Council Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just have one question for Director Teague. Um, the existing, the, the, the previously approved project could still be executed. Is that accurate? Well, the Avenue of France project. Yes. Yes, that is accurate. Their, their first phase of development were the two retail buildings on France. Those site plan approvals have expired. So they would, if they wanted to build any piece of the overall plan, they would need to come back through Planning Commission and City Council review process, uh, but they could build any one of those buildings on the site per the, the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Member Pearson. Had, uh, yeah, go ahead, Member Pearson. I, I, had, I had one one question. Um, the when, when you look at the feedback from residents, um, I would like to call out that there are a number of residents who said they understand the need for development. Uh, but they had concerns with this particular project. And so one of the one of the things that I can't rationalize in my mind, and it's a question around constraints. And so the 2017 site um, that you showed earlier uh, that was approved um, had lots of benefits in it. Um, the connectivity, um, east and west, north and south, uh, lots of greenery, the um, it met more of the principles within the guidelines. Um, and then when you look at what um, the applicant is going to provide today, you don't see the same connectivity, just different density profile. Um, there's greenery there, 
right? And so the question I have is, I would have assumed if there was a 2017 project that was approved, any applicant would have started with that uh, because this is what the city is looking for. And they would have started with that as a basis. Uh, yet what we are probably gonna, what we're gonna see tonight is quite a bit different. Um, and so I'd like to hear from staff what they think the constraints might be. Um, and I'm gonna have the same question for the applicant when the time is appropriate to just get from staff's perspective, what do you think the constraints are that would lead a developer to pr propose something that is quite a bit different from what was approved? Yeah, I think we all, we'd hear from the applicant that financially they couldn't, they couldn't build that project and financially make it work. One of the biggest differences is the, the parking, the cost of the parking to, to bury it. And there's quite a bit, there's about 800 to 900 parking stalls less than the previous plan. I think they were struggling with building the project that in their perception is so short parked. They believe that with the office uses, they, they need that parking. Whereas the, the previous plan that was approved, they didn't think they needed that. Um, I think those are those are probably the biggest constraints here. Okay, thank you. Other questions from council members? I'll go back to Director Teague. Otherwise, um, you know, when we we when we adopted these design guidelines, these the work that was done over a four-year period of time uh, by residents and uh, business uh, community members uh, and then um, uh, had the guidance of the architectural field office. We continue to use the architectural field office uh, as a consult consultant on some of these projects. The one that we uh, recently approved at uh, 70th in France, the U.S. bank site, was a site that uh, will be essentially uh, scraped. So you've got a bare site to work with. Uh, and then you're going to put up a new bank building and, and some other new buildings. I, I'm wondering when you think about those design experience guidelines um, and you think about them in the context of uh, this particular project where the two end cap buildings are going to be retained at 6,600 and 6,800. It's proposed that the two middle buildings then be torn down, 6,700 and 6,750 France be torn down and another development take place on the site. What kinds of challenges, if any, does that pose for a developer trying to meet those design experience guidelines that might have been uh, a different sort of challenge, if you will, for someone who has a bare site versus a site where they're trying to make sure they retain some existing buildings? Yeah, it definitely makes a big difference comparing the 70th in France project to this one. Um, having those two, saving those two existing buildings, you know, redeveloping a site where we're maintaining some of the building. I would add though, the plan approved in 2017 did that as well. Um, so maybe there, in, you know, this might be a question for the developer and they, they probably did consider it. How could they take that plan from 2017 that was approved you know, with the wound earths through still maintaining those two buildings and still provide additional parking somehow um, on the site. I think that's, you know, kind of a hybrid of what's proposed and what had been approved for the site. But there, that, it's, a, it's a distinct difference. We're not dealing with a, a where we're scraping a site and developing um, essentially a vacant parcel. Okay. Um, there were some things that uh, Mick Johnson of the Architectural Field Office liked about this plan, and that was kind of the north end of the of the plan. And if you had to characterize what his main concerns were, Director Teague, what would you say they were? Um, yeah, I think he's concerned with that with the the edge, you know, along Valley View. Um, he thinks there's a good start there with that liner building. Um, 
but th but that was a concern. But the the lack of pedestrian connections through through and around the site, um, as you can see, he didn't get into a lot of detail like he typically does with recommendations um, on how to fix the plan within this site. I think he. Um, sees more, um, it, there's a lot of challenges to it. Um, but I think those are some of the biggest concerns is that edge and the, the connectivity. All right. Member Pierce, did you have your hand up? Did I see something? Yes, go ahead, Member Pierce. Nope, nope, I didn't. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Anybody else have questions for staff at this point in time? Otherwise, we can uh, turn to uh, public testimony in this matter. Okay. So, uh, remember now, this is uh, the singular public hearing matter this evening. Uh, we're going to hear it now from residents. I'm going to open this up for public testimony. We can hear from residents or anyone else who would like to testify uh, regarding this matter. The call at number we'll call is 800 374 Zero two two one conference ID is six zero seven three nine two four. An operator will ask for your name and street address, and then you'll be put in the queue to speak. And Director Benerod will talk about how you accomplish getting into the council here in just a moment. And uh, just a reminder, you'll have three minutes to speak, and uh, and Manager Neil will remind you about thirty seconds in advance of the three minutes running that you're getting close to the time when you need to uh, finish up your testimony. So then you can. Think about wrapping up your comments. Um, Did we want right. to do the public or the uh, yeah. the applicant presentation? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. We got uh, you've got about twenty minutes, I think, allocated for the applicant's presentation. Correct. Yeah. Sorry, I missed, didn't mean to jump the gun there. Thank you. And so we have, I think, Andy McIntosh from McGoff Development, uh, and then uh, HG Architects Victor Pachati is here this evening as well. So go ahead, Director Teague, and introduce the applicants. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll just turn it over to Andy McIntosh from McGuff, and he has along with him uh, Victor Prashadi, the architect on the project. So, Andy? Great. Thank you, Kerry. You guys able to hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, Mr. McIntosh, go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to um, get my screen up um, and share that, and then I'll get started. Is my screen visible? It is, Mr. McIntosh. Great. Good evening. I'm Andy McIntosh with McGough. I'm joined by Victor Pachati of HGA, Tom Lincoln with Kimley Horn, and Dave Stahl with the Cunningham Group. We're pleased to be meeting with Edina's newly formed 2021 City Council and share commons on France, the redevelopment of 66 to 6800 France Avenue South. The site is owned by Wildemere and Olympus, two Edina-based businesses that call the project home, with Olympus in the North Building and Wildemere in the South Building. We've got a brief agenda tonight. Uh, Victor and I will share the presentation, and we're going to talk about um, why we are here. We're going to talk about the opportunity we have tonight. We're going to identify what makes this site different along that same vein as um, the mayor started to men mention earlier. Uh, Victor will take us on a tour of the Commons on France project in a little bit more detail than Kerry did. And then finally, um, a consideration of the rezoning and site plan approval. So why are we here? It's a fair question. Are we here to receive entitlement for nearly 1 million square feet of office, residential, medical, and retail and dining redevelopment? Yes and no. Uh, we already have that. Uh, the density and mix of uses has already been approved for this site. What we're now seeking is approval for an achievable and enhanced version of the project that is economically feasible and can actually get built. This Venn graphic illustrates the sweet spot right in the center that must be achieved for development projects to come to fruition. The balance of community desires, market realities, and economic viability. Without consideration for all three facets, concepts never progress to places. The proposed project has been recommended for denial by the city's design consultant, by the city planning staff, and by the planning commission. Those recommendations were based largely on the design critiques as measured against either the design experience guidelines, 
or the existing zoning on the site at 2017 Avenue on France entitlement that Carrie had on the screen earlier. We acknowledge that the proposed project does not comply 100% with the design experience guidelines and that it does not align with, and using the benefit of hindsight, misguided standards set by the 2017 plan. We will discuss how this redevelopment project, not a greenfield or a raise and build new project, an important distinction, garners different considerations. We have been able to resolve some of the shortcomings of the 2017 version relative to actual and possible transit alternatives. Both versions of the project consider a similar density to the site. 1.0 FAR, as Kerry mentioned, is the measurement. And for reference, this is approximately twice the density of the site today and less than half of the density recently approved for the US Bank project. Though we've shifted the quantities of those mixes, uh, those uses on the site. We are confident that this project aligns with the goals and aspirations of the Greater Southdale District Plan and is a better aligned with market realities to achieve economic feasibility through the lessons learned over two iterations and many years of planning this key redevelopment parcel. The balancing of community desires, market realities, and economic feasibility and how that manifests itself in the redevelopment of a 1970s office park is an important conversation to have. We hope that through the conversation, the council can identify a path to approving the requested rezoning and preliminary site plan approval while substantiating the design and planning tools that are intended to guide decision making in this district. That is what will lead to the type of sustainable redevelopment and growth envisioned for this important Edina commercial district. Before reviewing the significant community and public benefits that can be realized through this project, I think it's appropriate to quickly address some of the stakeholder concerns we've heard, essentially questioning why are we proposing to expand and enhance an office park when the future of office is uncertain as a result of the pandemic and the shift to remote work? It's a good question and one our team has asked itself. Since we have no post-pandemic data to study yet, we're relying on expert opinion and anecdotal examples. Some key findings of a global study conducted by Cushman and Wakefield indicate that following a few short years of softening, the office market will rebound to pre-pandemic levels by mid-decade. Companies will adopt a balance of remote work and in-office experience to maximize performance. Employees will seek that flexibility while appreciating the collaboration, mentoring, innovation, and learning that occurs at the office. There will continue to be a demand for office certainly differently than it has been in the past, but still it will be a valuable corporate tool moving forward. Thus, enhancing the existing office buildings for the post-pandemic future through the introduction of amenities otherwise not available to those working at home, indoor and outdoor collaboration spaces, a mix of dining, service retail, medical, health and wellness, and residential offerings will be critical. Commons on France accomplishes that. It also provides exciting public benefits. Land donated to the city for the construction of a water treatment facility, thus providing a more economic alternative to the site previously contemplated. District public parking on the north end of the site, essentially a replacement for the public parking that currently uses the surface lot for overflow capacity at Roslyn Park, fireworks displays and other community events. Stormwater management improvements to not only handle the capacity for this site, a site that has no stormwater management in place today, but to relieve some of the pressure on the municipal system that is currently overwhelmed and floods our property and other Lake Cornelia neighborhood properties during heavy rains. When the residential phase of the project is built, we will meet the city's affordable housing policy. A one and a half acre increase in green space and permeable surface on the 21 acre site compared to today. Sidewalks, plazas, pocket parks and other gathering places around the site and connecting it both east west and north south to other district amenities, a significant improvement of the public realm. The site will be transit ready for the future introduction of mobility alternatives in the district. Our vision for this project has remained consistent despite the many changes and improvements we've made to the plan. It is influenced by the Greater Southdale District Plan, much like the 2017 Avenue on France version of the project. Though much of the critique to date has centered on how we have elected to apply the design experience guidelines to this redevelopment, 
we have always been aligned with the Greater Southdale District Plan vision and the spirit of the design experience guidelines. It is important to note that the vision for this district contemplates a 50-year endeavor that is achieved in iterative steps, not one giant leap. The sheer scale of our 21-acre redevelopment, in essence, a live patient with businesses that will need to maintain operations through the improvements, means that it will be a phased project accomplished in three, four, or five steps. This allows for the project to evolve and adapt to the inevitable future changes as contemplated in the district vision. I'll share a few statements from the Greater Southdale District Plan that helped influence the vision and plan for the Commons on France commercial redevelopment. The district is considered a space for more capacity for growth and change than any other area of the city. It's envisioned as a concentration of jobs, residences, medical services, traffic, and activity. Building that future means making choices, sustainable choices, to meet the needs of today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. It offers a vision and articulates aspirational statements for desired outcomes in the evolution of the Greater Southdale District. The district plan is not so much a blueprint, but rather a compass. And the economic impact of this area is significant, particularly in terms of sustaining the tax base for the city of Edina. Since the Planning Commission meeting on November 18th, the city's economic development director issued a statement regarding the project. The entire letter is available online or in your packet, but a few excerpts include. This project would create a 21st century mixed use destination that adds activity and vitality to the greater Southdale area. The proposal is consistent and with a positive addition to the greater Southdale area. Direct benefits would include an increase in the property tax base, the creation of class A office space designed to consider tenant needs post pandemic, creation of modern medical office, the addition of new restaurant and ancillary retail services, creation of new jobs likely to include professional medical and retail service, the addition of new housing units at luxury and affordable price points, generate fees that are payable to the city of Edina. Though the city's community development director recommended denial of the application for rezoning and site plan approval, his staff report also provided a path for approval of the request. That path identified the following attributes to justify support of the project. The proposed land uses and density are consistent with the comp plan. The project would meet the following goals and policies of the comp plan, a pedestrian friendly environment, encouraging a successful mixed use development, create and maintain housing options, and ensure the public realm design respects community character, promotes community identity, and creates high quality experiences. Addressing the design experience guideline, the project, the following principles are included in the Commons on France project. Improved pedestrian connections to move people through and around the site. Providing additional public space around the perimeter of the site. High quality design. And providing district, uh, par pardon me, providing district parking and a water treatment facility. Our site is different. To date, much of the time and effort has been focused on community desires, one of the three circles in this Venn diagram. This includes everything from the task force that helped craft the Greater Southdale Design Experience Guidelines, the city's comp plan to the meetings we've had with stakeholders, the sketch plan process and engagement with city staff. It's a valuable part of the process and we absolutely have a better plan today than we did when we first engaged with the neighbors. Other important variables in a successful redevelopment include market realities and economic viability. Some of the market realities that impact the economic viability of the project and we need to be considered include. Our site is a redevelopment, not a greenfield project or a scrape the site and start from scratch pursuit. As soon as we made the decision to reinvest in the 66 and 6800 buildings, which is the most sustainable decision we could make with this project. We put the project in conflict with 100% application of the design experience guidelines. The site is not a rectangle and the positioning of the two existing buildings, one of which sits at a 45 degree angle to any of our access roads, requires compromise to a strict application of the street typologies and design principles contemplated throughout the district. As I mentioned, Commons on France is an enhanced and achievable version of the zoning already approved for the site. 
Some stakeholders have questioned our desire to comply with the design experience guidelines through the redevelopment of the site. <laughs> that isn't the problem. In 2017, that was achieved. Avenue on France was lauded for its compliance with the ideals that eventually were formalized in the design experience guidelines. This is the second attempt to redevelop this site. That plan had a few major flaws that through the benefit of hindsight, we recognize will not allow it to be built. One, it overemphasized destination retail, especially as that industry has been disrupted in the last few years. And two, it missed the mark on the volume and type of parking contemplated. No allowance was made for the thousand parking stalls required just to accommodate the tenants in the existing 66 and 6800 office buildings. Only parking for the new uses was considered. And the below building and below plaza parking proposed, though clearly preferred to surface and ramps, is not economically viable for these types of office and commercial uses in the Twin Cities suburbs. Though the district rightly aspires to be a pedestrian focused future and away from the auto focused reality of today, it uses Portland's Pearl District, shown here with its richly served transit system as a model for the urban planning and design principles of the Greater Southdale District Plan. One fundamental difference in reality is that transit options are currently limited in Edina. The future introduction of a transit will allow for greater flexibility in the growth of this district, but until that time, the storage and movement of automobiles is a reality that needs to be considered. District parking, like that proposed on the north end of our site, is a consideration of the Greater Southdale District Plan. There are five ways to deliver parking. Surface parking that costs about four or five thousand dollars a stall, a ramp stall at about four to five times that cost, a podium stall with office or housing above it, for example, at seven to eight times that cost, below building or executive parking at 10 times that cost, and below plaza parking at 12 times that cost or $60,000 plus dollars a stall. The 2017 version of this plan and the Greater Southdale District Plan contemplate parking being delivered via the bottom three methods. Clearly preferable again as it gets the cars out of sight and allows for greater focus on the pedestrian experience. Except for luxury or high end market rate housing, those methods are not realistic or economically viable in the suburban Twin Cities. It is why there are few, if any, examples. For office, medical, and most housing, it is hard enough to deliver tastefully screened ramp parking at a market price point. To provide further context to the issue of parking, both volume and cost, I'll use this example. Most people I've asked agree that the nicest office building today in Edina is the Pentagon Office Park. That's shown in the upper left corner here. It's held up very well since it was originally developed 20 to 30 years ago. Any new office project in the city will compete with Centennial Lakes for companies looking to relocate to Edina. If Centennial Lakes or Commons on France cannot provide enough parking to satisfy that company's parking needs, that company will simply move the business to a different city. The market drives parking quantities, not city code or any district guidelines. As for parking cost and its impact on rent and therefore market viability, we can look at those same five methods of parking here, surface, ramp, podium, below building or below plaza. The cost of delivering each helps drive the rent required to be charged to office tenants, anywhere from $1.51 a square foot for the surface stall up to $18.14 for the below plaza stall. You compare that to the current market for Class A office in Edina, $19 a square foot at Centennial Lakes, including parking. And you can see the challenge for a developer when we haven't even considered all of the other costs for the building landscaping, design, and site work. In the suburbs of the Twin Cities currently, where par parking is not widely a revenue generating amenity, but rather a free amenity, surface and ramp parking are the only two types of economically viable solutions for office, medical, and most types of residential. Victor is now gonna take you on a tour of the Commons on France project. Victor? Thank you, Andy. Audio check, can everybody hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good Mr. evening, Mayor. Mayor I would advise you that we are already over the 20 minutes. 
uh, allocated to. So however you want to proceed from here, that's just where we are in terms of time allowed. Mr. Pachati, go ahead, please finish up. Okay, thank you, Mayor Hovland and mayors of the council. Director Teague provided a very thorough tour through the site, so I will attempt not to be redundant to what Kerry has already shared. Rather, as we move about the site, I've been making some notes and maybe contribute some observations that are hopefully helpful and of substance to the conversation that's already taken place. The site plan that you see in front of you is surrounded and wrapped by approximately a one mile um, walking circuit that populates the different green edges around the site. A green edge facing Valley View, a green edge facing 66th Street, and a green edge facing France Avenue. A lot of focus has been given to the Valley View green edge. It's, um, it's worth noting that that is considered the West Promenade as part of the design experience guidelines. That particular typology, it must be said, contradicts some of the other stakeholder goals for that edge, specifically the preservation of a mature grove of trees centered to the site and also contradicts some of the existing constructed buildings on the site. So the development team has proposed um, the spirit of those guidelines rather than meeting them directly through the construction of townhomes to create a park-like greenway that embraces the aesthetic of the tree grove and stretches that to the north and to the south, acknowledging that the development is a threshold area uh, transition from the single family Cornelia homes to France Avenue, the development team proposes that the best foreground to that transition experience is in fact an elongated park. Along 66th Street, one correction, there was a rendering that you'll see that Director Teague described as being along Valley View. That rendering was actually along 66th Street. 66th Street is listed as a boulevard in the design experience guidelines, which actually does not state a height limit along a boulevard corridor. In the proposed plan, the 66th Street side is a six-story housing wrap entirely conceal concealing a parking structure and is actually at a height that is much lower and attempts to be more judicious and respectful to neighbors to the north than what the design experience guidelines um, would offer. Along France Avenue, there is a full 50-foot landscape buffer uh, with boulevard trees and access to plazas at multiple points through the site. Next slide, Andy. Mr. Pichetti, uh, yeah, if you could move quickly through this, I know, I think you've got somebody else. I'd like to have you guys wrap up within five to seven minutes. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, we've already seen this aerial photograph that hovers somewhere above the water tower. Next image, Andy. This is an image of the plazas that foreground the south side of the new office building. There's been discussion about not allowing vehicular traffic north-south through the site, and that's actually by design. The development team proposes to embrace and provide multiple paths for pedestrians to circulate north-south on the site, but by limiting for vehicles, it creates places that can be populated and programmed for pedestrian activity. Next slide, Andy. Um, this diagram, which we can come back to if needed, illustrates some of the neighborhood connections in each and every crosswalk to the neighborhoods beyond, to the north, east, and west of the site. Next slide. There are two through block connections going east to west. This one is a view of the through block connection south of the 6800 building. That has, um, the street area has been narrowed. The pedestrian areas have been widened to 18 feet in front of the 6800 building, 12 feet on the south side, in excess of the green area that's suggested by the design experience guidelines. Next, please. 
This is a view of the parkway, the proposed green space and park that would become the first experience of the transition from the Cornelia neighborhood. Next. An aerial view hovering above Roslyn Park, looking at the six-story housing wrap around the parking structure and the 13-story mid-rise um, housing building. Next. a view of the 13-story um, residential project looking down France Avenue. Next. Within the site, there actually is a vertical mixed use. If mixed use is defined by retail, food and beverage, and other amenities at a plaza and street level with office and housing above, um, those are exactly the kind of programs being contemplated for the site. Next, please. And this is the view I was mentioning. It's actually looking down along 66th Street rather than Valley View with the six-story housing projects. And I believe that's the last one, Andy. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, everybody, for letting me get through that. Appreciate it. Yep, and in closing, uh, we believe that by recognizing the site as a sustainable redevelopment of an existing district asset, and balancing the desires of the community with market and economic realities, the City Council has a path to both honor the municipal planning tools that were crafted by community stakeholders to guide the future growth and change in the Greater Southdale District and to approve the rezoning and site plan applications for Commons on France that will enable the transformation and redevelopment of the office park into a vibrant mixed use example of the future envisioned for the district. Thank you for your time, your service, and your consideration. We're available for questions. Thank you. Um, all right. Now, my apologies if I gave uh, anybody on the applicant's team some high anxiety over thinking about the public testimony in this matter. I knew you wanted to make a presentation. So uh, now we're going to move to uh, public testimony. Unless anybody on the council has a question for the applicant at this point in time, Yes, Member Jackson. Yes, I have uh, just two questions. One is, um, as a phased project, I'm, I'm not familiar with how these work. There have been some ra concerns raised about extended um, dust and noise from construction for 10 years solid. Can you, you know, Mr. McIntosh, you've done these types of projects before. Can you tell me what um, what that would be like for the experience of, of a, how a phased project, the disruption um, to the neighbors and to the existing tenants? Sure. Um, thank you for your question. Um, the, the site's a big site. So uh, Carrie mentioned that this is just a big property. And um, so uh, any development or construction that happens on the site is going to require the relocation of the parking for the uses that are active on the site in order to free up any of the surface parking lot space on that site to get some vertical development we have to put those cars someplace in essence it's it's a little bit of the finger puzzle game so um we will uh do that strategically as we develop the site we always have to provide enough parking so that we can move the puzzle piece for uh freeing up the uh, pad site for the future phase so that's maybe a description of the the phasing of the project and then as far as the impact um, it would be the equivalent of about a three block um, uh, um, portion of a city. So if you thought of three smaller projects, it would be no different than the impact um, if three smaller projects were being developed, um, you know, one right after another. And we certainly have done projects like this in areas a lot more um, dense and uh, populated um, than this site. And so there are plenty of means and methods to mitigate the noise and disruption to not only the tenants that we're trying to continue to accommodate on our site, um, but the neighbors that live in proximity to this project. Terrific. We would work with this. We would work with the city to define that. That's a typical practice before any construction project. Thank you. Yep. Um, the other thing is, the one thing that for me and the Southdale Experience Guidelines is really central is the 200-foot blocks. And along the 66th Street part of the development, 
you've got a big building and then a, a tall building. Can you talk about why it's not broken into those 200 foot in that particular part of this development? Mm -hmm. Victor, maybe I'll take an initial stab and then feel free to piggyback. Um, it, it's um, <laughs> like many things on this site, it's driven by parking. And um, in order to um, create a parking ramp that efficiently stores vehicles, you need certain dimensions for that ramp. Um, if you create ramps that are different shapes, um, that price per stall number that I shared earlier, um, it gets a lot higher um, quicker. So um, we started with um, that 200 foot grid and um, in some parts of the site, it aligns very well. Um, uh, Council member Pierce had a question earlier about um, constraints. And um, one of the constraints that um, we have on the site that would fall into what I would describe of as a physical constraint on the site is we've got a couple of existing curb cuts to a Hennepin County Road on France Avenue um, that we need to work around. Um, and so when you start to try to implement on a site like this, that 200 by 200 foot grid, and you're working around a couple of existing buildings and you're working around a couple of existing curb cuts and you're working around um, the existing trees, you, you start to add up some physical constraints even before you get to some of the economic constraints on the site. And so it does not, um, uh, as a redevelopment project, um, allow for that direct applicable um, design experience grid. Okay, thank you. And then just very briefly, the fire station is off the table at this point. Is that correct? <laughs> the fire station is off the table. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Other questions from other council members? At this point in time for the applicant. <clears throat> One of the uh, emails we received uh, had, a, a, I think, a litany of some of the concerns that the Point of France residents had. Uh, one is uh, the shadow study, that uh, you might be casting a shadow on their building uh, at Point of France uh, at some point during the year. Could you comment on that shadow study? I think Director Teague alluded to that earlier. Uh, would you, are there times of the year when you might throw a shadow onto uh, Point of France if this project were approved? And if so, when and, and uh, how long would that shadowing last during a particular day in a particular season? Victor, do you want to take a stab at that? And then I can give maybe a, a, a point of reference for a couple of buildings in the district that are positioned similarly to how this building and, and Point of France would be positioned. Yeah, uh, I'll share my recollection. And then, uh, Carrie, we can certainly fact check it here on the spot if you were to bring up the shadow study again. We run those studies at the solstice and the equinox. So, of course, the worst case will be the winter solstice. December 21st when that sun is so low. I believe at the winter solstice that the shadow would just be catching the very bottom or the very base of Point of France. Um, so the impact um, is qualitatively speaking uh, very minor, almost nothing onto the Point of France uh, resident. You can see the solstice diagrams are the three views across the bottom of the page at three different times of, of day. And we can certainly provide more times and more data on this um, should city staff and council desire it. And then I'll just add to that um, for a, a real world kind of point of comparison because it's hard to judge anything off of a, a graphic this size. Those, um, the, the Point of France building that exists today and the proposed location of the 13 story apartment building would sit about 300 feet um, apart. And to give you uh, a comparison, that is almost exactly the same distance that the, um, shoot, I just drew a blank, uh, that one Southdale place um, sits compared to um, the uh, hotel uh, just to the south of it. 
one five second follow up. It is the center diagram on the bottom that is 12 noon on December 21st. And that is the shadow I was referring to. It doesn't quite stretch to the base of a point of France. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And then, Mr. McIntosh, just to reinforce that, uh, uh, that distance, uh, you're talking wall to wall is your estimate. It's uh, the wall, be the south wall of one South Hill place to the north wall of uh, the Weston. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so uh, our our north wall of the 13-story building to the south wall of Point of France is approximately 300 feet. That is the same distance as the north wall of the Weston to the south wall of One South Dale. And then uh, speak a little bit to the differential on height between uh, your proposed building and the existing Point of France. Sure, I'll... Um, the uh, the two buildings are both 13 stories. Um, so we used that as a guide as we were determining what's appropriate for another corner at the intersection of 66th and France Avenue. And there's um, a standard established at that intersection for a residential building. Um, the difference though in height is just modern construction versus the um, uh, typical floor to floor heights that were used when Point of France was built. So um, I um, can pull up an image here that will help describe that in detail. Bear with me. <clears throat> Carrie, I'm going to um, try sharing my screen again. Okay, you should be able to see an image now that is a cross section of 66th um, Street, and it demonstrates the setbacks from curb lines, and it shows that at 13 stories, Point of France is approximately 132 feet, and our 13 story mid rise building with modern day floor to floor heights would be approximately 148 feet. All right, thank you. Did that prompt any other questions from council members? All right, let's um, let's now turn to um, public input here. I'm going to open this matter up for public testimony. And uh, so those residents uh, or interested parties that wish to uh, testify in this matter, recall the uh, Number is 800-374-0221 with conference ID 607-3924. And um, I'm hoping Mr. Thiem found his way back into the queue. Uh, you're an operator. I'll ask for your name and address. Uh, Director Benarat, do we have any folks on the line that wish to speak? Good evening again, Mayor and members of the Council. Our first speaker in the public hearing tonight is Mr. Paul Nelson. Operator, will you please unmute Paul's line? And then, Paul, once you have been unmuted, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. You can go ahead, Paul. All right, thanks. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Paul Nelson, and I reside at 5220 Dugan Plaza. I am the uh, chair of the Economic, economic Development uh, <laughs> Economic Development Committee of the Edina Chamber of Commerce. Uh, our group has reviewed the proposed development and believe this revitalization will enhance not only the subject property, but also the surrounding Southdale area, as well as our community at large. This owner and developer is not simply coming into the city as a first time developer, but is the existing owner of the property and looking to make improvements to an aging facility that needs to keep pace with the current eco economic climate. The developer has worked closely with the new Southdale area guidelines and has followed this document where possible as it relates to this property. The project is aesthetically pleasing with small grid blocks which effectively break up the mega blocks that this area was originally developed with. The materials, landscaping, and public spaces are well designed 
and will make vast improvements to the sea of asphalt that is currently occupying the majority of the property today. The tallest structure is aligned with aligned to present the narrowest pros profile to the Cornelia neighborhood and adheres to the guidelines for the west side of it, France Avenue. In addition to the proposed buildings, in addition, the proposed buildings will step back from the street, initially with abundant setbacks, and further the buildings uh, gaining height, uh, and further with the buildings gaining height as you move toward the interior of the block. This will make the development approachable and welcoming from the street, as well as from the pedestrian perspective. This long-term redevelopment will begin to transform the Southdale region and set the tone for others who wish to redevelop property in this corridor. I have also submitted a letter from our Chamber's Economic Development Committee, which outlines these and other attributes of the project. So as you weigh the various objectives, please find a way to move this project forward for the benefit of our entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Director Benarat? We have someone else in the queue. I, I have a handful of other people on the call, including Richard, but I do not have anyone in the queue. Uh, Richard and anyone else on the line, if you're interested in speaking, please press star one on your telephone keypad and that will get you in the queue. With that, I would like to introduce Richard again. Richard, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Richard Thiem, 6566 France Avenue South, Point of France, uh, in Edina. Okay. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Board of Directors and the Point of France and share our concerns about the impacts of this project across the street from our homes. Our concerns are ours, but they overlap with those of everyone who lives, works, and transits through the Southdale area. A key concern is the negative legacy this unimaginative project would bequeath to our children and the next generation of Edina residents. It would suggest the quality of life issues are secondary and lots with chock-a-block office buildings and parking garages are primary. There are good reasons why the Edina planners voted no to this project unanimously as it currently exists. Centennial Lake, by contrast, is a beautifully designed imaginative space with paths and green space that invites walking, activities, and dining out. Planners staring into a quarry did not jump to that design. It took imagination, hard work, and a commitment to enhancing the area in every way. The Commons on France proposal does not do that. Specifically, the project does violate the guidelines and the spirit of the Greater Southdale District Plan. Density of both office and residential space is excessive. Proposed buildings exceed the four-story allowance in height and the 200-foot allowance in length. There is a dearth of walking space through green areas and inadequate connectivity to the neighborhood. A virtually unbroken wall, for whatever reasons, turns 66th Street into an obstacle, not an invitation, there is no relief from glass and concrete. These facts do obviously impact property values and quality of life. Traffic will increase. Privacy will diminish. Obstructive views will increase. Air, noise, and light pollution with 66th Street icier due to those shadows will be worse over the long 10 to 12 years of projected construction. 10 to 12 years of noise, trucks, and as Andy told us previously, pile drivers pounding the neighborhood from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 to 5 on Saturday. Really, think about it. Homeowners will need to keep windows closed at all times. Balconies will rarely be used. Construction dirt and dust will fill the air. Air conditioners and furnaces will run constantly to filter the air. And the horrific noise will, and this is documented, impact our mental and physical health. Pile drivers impact our health. Meanwhile, taxpayer support from these same homeowners through TIF will be significant. Commons on France is not neighborhood friendly or neighbor friendly. It is developer friendly. Send this plan back to the drawing board. Please invite a better plan that enhances the neighborhood by providing green space and fewer buildings and is celebrated 
for its design not tolerated. That is the legacy we hope to give subsequent generations, and that is the future we owe to our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seem. Again, Mayor, members of the council, I do have a handful of other people on the call, but no one in the queue. If you'd like to speak at this time, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Uh, that will get you in the queue to speak. Again, star or the asterisk symbol, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Um, I don't yet see anyone else. My clock shows that it's eight. Oh, I have someone. Um, I would please please like to introduce Mr. James Jensen. Operator, please unmute James's line. And James, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Yeah, my, my name is Jim Jensen, and I live at 6924 Dawson Lane in, in Edina. And so this is, um, the proposed development is very, very close to where I live with, with my family for over a decade. Can, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Okay, so um, I'm yes, against this you, Mr. development. Mr. Yes, I'm, I'm against this. Okay, yes, yeah, so thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm against this proposed development. It's out of scale, out of scope. It is um, the vertical height adjacent to the residential neighborhood is way too high. I do note that it is um, zoned for four stories. Um, I'm very concerned about traffic. And I note that in, in this traffic study, France Avenue and 66th Street is the troubling, the troubled intersection. Um, I'll draw your attention to chart two, chart three, chart eight in the traffic study. And it looks like um, that intersection will eventually be level of service E, which is gridlock, um, if you look at those vertical bars. And I would say that, 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 that the traffic study is just a rough estimate and um, Traffic is going to be a nightmare with this, and you know, eight thousand total trips, you know, times two, sixteen thousand cars. That's a very significant increase in traffic in the area. I'm very concerned about cut through traffic and the safety of children going to Cornelia um, Elementary School. Um, and, and I say that because this is such a bold increase in density, cars, people, height, activity, um, in, in, in fairly close proximity to the, to the elementary school. Um, you know, I feel this um, development is very poorly thought out and, and it, is, it is a very um, bad location for this. Um, you know, and I agreed with some of the comments of the previous caller. I'm very concerned about pollution especially during the construction phase, which I've learned tonight is gonna to go on for many years. And, um, you know, many of you know, Lake Cornelia is a, um, it's a polluted lake, it's an ecologically troubled lake. And, um, you know, pollution from a construction site over many years would have additional um, deleterious, you know, um, impacts to the lake. 30 seconds remaining. And, um, all right, and then I'll just add that um, I do not believe that the, the traffic study took into account some of the recent um, rezonings. One is called the Bauer Tower, and then, of course, the, um, the U.S. Bank redevelopment, which is you know, obviously deeply, deeply unpopular with the residents here on this side. So um, I'm hoping that this development will not be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Anyone else, Director Benarat, in the queue? I, um, I have one more person on the line who has not yet spoken tonight. That person is not indicating a desire to speak. As a reminder, I need you to press star one on your telephone keypad if you would like to provide testimony to the council. Otherwise, because there is a slight delay in the broadcast for our Facebook Live and cable television viewers, I would recommend we wait a minute or so before moving on. My clock shows that it's 8.56. I will watch the clock and let you know um, if I get someone in the queue or if a minute has passed, whichever comes first. 
Thank you, Director Benarok. I have someone on the line. Um, operator, will you please unmute the line of Julie Peterson? Um, Julie, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Julie Corvey Peterson. I live at 6566 France Avenue South, and I guess I don't need to leave my phone number. Unit number, Julie. Um, PH 12 and 1103. If okay. I am now on. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Peterson. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm a resident at Point of France and I have provided some input and illustrations with some of the concerns that I as a resident have. Um, I also want to uh, state that Mr. Nelson made reference to how the development steps back um, and is inviting. I encourage you to take a look at some of the illustrations that I had an architect's friend do for me. And if you were to stand at the intersection facing south in the median of 66th and France, the view that you have is a 13-story wall and it is the maximum, or the minimum distance rather, away from the street, that is not at all inviting. And as someone else stated, I believe Mr. Thiem stated, the view, if you would look to the right down that street at that intersection, if you were waiting for a red light, would look as though you could show movies on this massive wall. I don't find that at all inviting. And I guess I don't believe that they're following the design standards and that they have, you know, really taken into consideration what the view is from what people have been referring to as the gateway to the Edina Southdale area. That looks more like a prison wall than it looks like an inviting development. I'm not at all opposed to development. As a matter of fact, I love watching construction but I think the placement of the particular buildings has not been well thought out. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Again, I'm without anyone in the queue. As a reminder to anyone on the call, if you'd like to speak, please press star one on your telephone keypad. That's the asterisk symbol followed by the number one. Um, because there is a slight delay in the broadcast, I would recommend we wait a minute or so before moving on. My clock shows that it's uh, about 8.59. I'll let you know when I have a speaker or 9 o'clock, whichever comes first. Thank you. It's nine o'clock and I do not have anyone else in the queue, so I think it is safe for you to move on. All right, thank you, Director Benarat. All right, folks, we've had some uh, public input here and we've had a presentation by the applicant and the staff. Are uh, there any further questions at this point in time for council members of uh, any of the people that testified? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Member Pierce. I um, I like to go back to the question about constraints um, just briefly uh, with um, uh, Mr. McIntosh. Um, Please. So we talked about parking as being one that um, I see your design of being above grade and then wrapping that structure is is a way of 
of dealing with that constraint. Um, you talked about that a bit. Uh, you gave another example of curbs being a physical constraint that you needed to work around. Um, and so just comparing the 2017 uh, plan again that uh, was approved, I, I haven't heard of anybody who didn't like that design, called it creative, imaginative, uh, versus what you're showing us uh, today. Um, can you, what are the, what are, what are other constraints that you see between those two um, that um, are not physical constraints that you have to work around, but things that um, you might be able to design differently? Good question. Um, absolutely. Um, if we could build and deliver the 2017 Avenue on France plan, uh, we would not have put ourselves through um, through this process and this amount of critique. Um, you mentioned parking, and it starts with parking. And the physical constraints on the site and then the trickle-down effect for the economic constraints on the site are largely driven by parking. And so the reason that the 2017 version of the plan um, uh, was so much better received is that three quarters of the parking that was proposed on that plan sat below grade. And so it was either that below building or below plaza style parking that I described earlier. And it cannot be delivered for the types of uses that we're cons considering on this site in the quantity that it needs to be um, provided for for those uses. So as soon as we determined that, and then you look for alternatives for where to store those vehicles, it starts to have a trickle down effect for where buildings and public space and green space are positioned. And so um, though I appreciate um, the um, process that the city went through, and I think I, I, I wasn't involved in 2017, but my understanding is this project was active at the time and uh, helped uh, further the discussion for what eventually became the design experience guidelines. And it was an important kind of active living project during that time. And um, it was well aligned with those principles that eventually um, got created to be the design experience guidelines it was not tested for what the market could bear. And in the con um, convening years, we've had a chance to do that and have come to the conclusion that parking cannot sit below grade in that volume and be effectively delivered. And that's why other than the Bank of America building on the south end of the site, um, none of those other proposed buildings have moved forward. Thank you. Groundwater, I didn't mention it earlier, and you said not physical, but groundwater in this site is a true consideration, and it's part of the reason that um, the the positioning of parking below grade is so cost prohibitive, is you've got groundwater um, that sits um, not that much below the surface of the site, and so um, you have to manage that or displace that um, or avoid those areas when you're locating any of your below grade parking. Thank you. Other questions for either the applicants team or staff? Uh, Member Sutton. Uh, yeah, Mr. McIntosh, um, when we heard from Mr. Speck in his report, he seemed to suggest that the parking that you're proposing for the site is about double what is necessary. Do you disagree with that? I do. Can you explain? Um, the best way I can explain it is um, the parking is driven, the, the parking that we are proposing providing is driven by what the market is requesting. And so the example I gave um, to um, the planning commission um, when this came up is if you owned a business 
and you wanted to locate your business in a building in, on at Commons on France, and I can't give you confidence that you're going to be able to park all of your employees on that one day a year where you happen to have a gathering of your entire staff, you are going to be hesitant in a suburban location like this where there are no other ways to access the site than their personal automobile vehicles to locate your business there. And so um, the 2017 plan um, was overly confident in how complementary uses on the site, meaning residents in off hours of the business, could share parking stalls. And they provided a volume of parking that was more in line with what um, SPAC has um, recommended, but is disconnected pretty significantly with what an office tenant or a potential future resident of one of the apartment buildings would expect for their own personal use. And so we, as a developer, don't love paying for and building parking. Um, and that's one of the things that we like about this project being a phased delivery is if over the course of its um, development, either transit is introduced or the market changes and either through shared vehicle usage or other means, we're not so driven, um, pardon the pun, by um, personal automobile, vehicle, automobile vehicle usage. Um, we can deliver fewer parking stalls um, based on what the market is is requesting at that time. Do you perceive that that dynamic changes depending on the mix of office, residential, retail, etc.? Yeah, so the ratios we use do change um, for each of those types of uses. And uh, just to give you a couple of quick examples, medical office is one of the most demanding types of um, commercial use for parking. And so for that building on the site, we've allocated five stalls per thousand, per thousand square feet of that building. And so that is actually on the lower end of what, um, you know, commercial real estate brokers that work with medical clients in the Edina area tell us is acceptable for their clients. For the new office building, we've used four per thousand, which is again on the lower end of what the Cushman and Wakefields of the world would say is expected of modern class A office space. For our existing buildings, which are older buildings and so have some inherent inefficiencies in them, we've allocated three stalls per thousand, which is absolutely on the low end of office space. And then the retail uses and the residential uses each have their own ratios. And so when you take all of those uses together, um, you arrive at what the market expects for, for parking. And that's the 2,800-ish stalls that we've shown on the, the proposed plan. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for either the applicant or Director T for our consultants? Mr. Spack, someone uh, mentioned uh, in their testimony, um, I think it was Mr. Jensen was concerned about whether we had taken into account from a traffic study standpoint, uh, the other developments that uh, have been approved that are in progress of being constructed, thinking of the millennium on uh, 66th and uh, Xerxes or York or transitions to York or even the U.S. bank site. Uh, project. Were those taken into account uh, incrementally in determining uh, your opinion with respect to uh, the traffic movements in this particular project? Uh, generally, but not specifically. And what I mean by that is we did apply trend line growth to the area traffic based on what has been happening over the past few years. Uh, but as we can see from this development, just because a project is being contemplated, it doesn't mean it's going to be built uh, as approved. So we do not forecast specifically for each project. We've got some projects uh, in process, specifically the Millennium right down the street on 66th. That's not speculative at all. I mean, it's being built. I'm, I'm wondering 
why you wouldn't have looked at the projected volumes there and how it impacts the overall traffic situation no. as opposed to looking at trend lines which are which is valid too i think but here you got actual an actual project with a certain number of units and projected traffic volume uh, we just looked at trend lines we don't look at specific and that's what we've been doing for more than a decade in Edina, i guess okay all right, um, Mr. McIntosh, um, what's your thought, what's your opinion, uh, your input on the design experience guidelines as to when they can uh, sort of be fully embraced and employed as to when they can only be partially employed? Because I think your argument is that the design experience guidelines can be met in part, but and, and met in the context of uh, capturing the spirit of the guidelines, but your project can't meet them all. I'll take a stab at that, Mayor. Um, the Southdale District is a extremely large area, and the district plan contemplates um, a 50-year vision. And the ability block by block on redevelopment projects like ours, where you are not starting with a, a blank canvas of applying the design experience guidelines on a specific property or a specific block within that larger district is going to be imperfect. And um, and it, it that, that burden falls on the council um, to ultimately determine um, is there enough of a spirit of what we're trying to accomplish with this important Greater Southdale District Plan, which is a, a very aspirational and forward-looking tool. Um, even though it's not being applied perfectly and 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 do we put value in the reason that it's not being applied perfectly which is the preservation and reinvestment in existing assets in the district so our office park has you know a 49 million dollar tax value today that's an important asset um, for the district and for the city and um, it it is also um, an opportunity to revitalize over 360,000 square feet of office space that is still relatively well occupied and used. Um, and so uh, I think there are justifiable reasons for finding compromise to the design experience guidelines because of the choice to redevelop a parcel as opposed to scrape it and start new. All right, thank you for that. And then also, uh, there are proposed public benefits that would accrue uh, due to the uh, proposed project. Um, if the project weren't approved, what, what are those public benefits uh, that we could view as a, a potential missed opportunity here. And I'll ask Director Teague that question. Do I need to restate it? Was that expressed well enough for you to understand what I was getting at there? Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. Um, I, the public benefits that are proposed here would be the district parking within that north ramp. How many spaces that is? I'm hearing they need all 2,800, but there might be some shared opportunities. You know, we can work out those details. So it would be the district parking there, uh, the potential for providing the land for the water treatment facility, and then any public easements that would be placed over the sidewalks around the site, um, through the site. Those are the three that. Oh, and then, of course, the affordable housing, uh, providing um, affordable housing either within the project or um, the fees in lieu of units. So those are the kind of the four primary that I can pick up for public benefits. 
I think there was one other one, if I recall correctly, and I'd like to have your comment on that. And that was, uh, I think this property gathers stormwater from a bunch of other properties. And I think the stormwater management system that was discussed, I assume that's a public benefit too. That is a public benefit. This site is taking on water from the street. Um, so in addition to accommodating all the water on their own site, they are accommodating some additional. So that, that is certainly a public benefit as well. Right. And, and Director Milner, uh, have you done any preliminary pricing on the cost of a water treatment plant embedded in a parking structure at um, 6,600, 6,800 France? Well, we haven't because this this uh, concept doesn't, I think it's better to embed it within a parking structure. The concept in front of you tonight, it's a standalone building. So there's things we have to work out there for what's the separation and access and stuff like that. So we haven't put any numbers to it because there's a lot of questions to answer yet. Could we assume that the potential cost would be less than the cost we were projecting across the street uh, under the water tower? Yes, because of that, probably a little less architectural because one side of the structure would be next to the parking ramp and it's, it's uh, adjacent to residential versus trying to be an iconic building on France Avenue. I still I think uh, Member Pierce has raised a, a really interesting question. Director Teague, you alluded to it a bit. And that was the notion that the Avenue on France project seemed to be able to meet these uh, design principles that we've established, the design experience guidelines. But this one can't and i still would like a little bit better articulation i guess from the applicant as to understanding that parking is a significant issue here i need more detail around the, the issues as to uh, why you can't do the 2017 project and if it's a if that if it's that combination of looking at as you characterize it community desires market realities and economic feasibility then explain the interaction uh, or interrelationship of those two, of those three factors relative to this uh, Avenue on France project and the existing project that you're proposing. Yeah, I'll take another crack at it. Um, you hit it on the head. It is um, acknowledging that the 2017 version of the plan had a disproportionate amount of weight placed on community desires and and thus it was widely um, applauded um, and it uh, positioned all of the parking uh, or three quarters of the parking on the site below grade and out of sight and then out of mind and um, and and that was well received um, for good reason um, what it didn't do is acknowledge the realities of the cost of that decision. And when the attempt then was made to bring forward a project and, and, and begin to transform that property, uh, it wasn't possible. So no office tenant was able or willing to pay the cost of what it would be required to occupy that new office building when the parking was below plaza and below building parking. Um, similarly for the hotel and medical and retail uses that were contemplated on the site um, at that time. Mm -hmm. And so though we don't disagree that um, the pedestrian experience um, for the 2017 version of the plan would have been exceptional. Um, the renderings, which I'm glad Carrie didn't share, are, are gorgeous. The site would have been a, a wonderful pedestrian experience. Um, it's, it's not a realistic standard in 2020 or 2021 for commercial development in the Twin Cities suburbs. Parking needs to be able to be not just conceptually designed um, attractively, but
but it also needs to be delivered at an economic price point that users, whether they're apartment occupiers, uh, patients uh, visiting their uh, care provider at the medical office building or tenants in the commercial office buildings uh, would be willing to pay. That's not to say you're not doing, you're not proposing some underground parking, though, as I understand. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. We we do still have um, below building parking um, where we've got a footprint of a building. There will be a, a level of executive parking at that location. And we've got um, at our uh, parking ramp locations, we've got a level of parking that is either built into the grade that exists on our site because France Avenue sits about a story higher than Valley View Road or is below grade there. So we are being strategic about where to introduce that below grade parking, but it's not throughout the site as was contemplated in 2017. Right. Thank you for that clarification. Does that cause any other questions from council members? Mr. Mayor, if yeah, I Dr. Might, um, the When looking at the 2017 plan, you know, it's being held up at high on a pedestal is meeting the design guidelines or the experience guidelines. There are some flaws to that plan as well. You know, it's not set up in perfect 200 by 200 blocks. There are some buildings that were contemplated to exceed that 200 foot length, the medical building to the north, um, even some, even the hotel um, and some of the retails expand beyond that 200 by 200 foot block. And then there's no liner buildings along Valley View. You know, there's surface parking lots um, along Valley View as well. So there are some flaws. You know, no project can completely meet all of the criteria that we're looking at. Uh, so I just wanted to, to point that out. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. The liner buildings along France. I know we talked about that in 2017, and and again on this project, but. Uh, don't the liner buildings as proposed, and I think uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Victor Pachati talked about this, uh, wouldn't that require the elimination uh, or substantial elimination of that oak savanna grove that's behind uh, those two middle buildings that would be proposed for coming down now? It would, if, uh, if yes. Some of that landscaping there in the middle would have to be removed in order to provide those liner buildings further to the south. If it's helpful, I can share a diagram that we shared during the planning commission that demonstrates that Valley View Road edge. Could be. I'll share the screen again, Carrie. Okay. Victor, are you able yes. to see the screen? Yes, would you like me to uh, summarize this, Andy? Yeah, do you want to, um, this was a slide that we used during our planning commission meeting and Victor can walk you through uh, the study we did of the street typology 1A on Valley View Road versus the uh, existing conditions there. Sure, yeah, we did this illustration to help be more quantitative about cross-referencing the design experience guidelines with the proposal. And this goes right to the heart of what Andy has been sharing about attempting to meet the spirit of the guidelines, which is to transition from Cornelia to France in a way that is layered and harmonious. So in the lower left-hand corner, that's an excerpt from the design experience guidelines showing the street typology that would occur along Valley View. This is something that Carrie shared earlier. So the plan diagram simply takes that typology and maps it onto the existing site. Each of those small blue rectangles is about the scale of a market rate townhome. So we're able to see um, how many could be accommodated there. Now, the red arrows indicate that there are a number of existing site access points onto the site. We're not proposing to add more. There are two access points that represent through block connections. And of note, off of Valley View are also all the service access points to the existing 6600 and 6800 buildings. 
Both of those have a small complement of indoor parking below them. That's where that is accessed. And every, every building has a back door, the recycling, the trash, that is all located in that area and serviced off of Valley View. Those would certainly be detractors for the possibility of lining Valley View with townhomes and having service vehicles pass through those developments. The townhomes in the center between the two red lines, that's what was referenced earlier. We know that preserving the amenity of mature trees, which takes decades to grow, has been an important metric for the project throughout. So a literal deployment of this street typology would require the removal of those that grove of trees that um, has been important both to the community as well as to the development team. Lastly, when town, single townhomes are designed or in a row house configurations, they require parking, of course, proximate or connected to the townhome, meaning one drives off of a road into an enclosed parking, their garage for the townhome. Those townhomes could be either one-sided, meaning one would drive onto the site and circulate along the yellow line but that yellow line would feature a number of access points for cars into each townhome, which the development team believes is not the experience in the spirit of the guidelines. If the townhomes are two-sided, meaning they have a face towards Valley View and a face inward towards the site, now those individualized garages are accessed um, off of Valley View as well as the internal workings of the site. So this is the analysis that the development team did relative to this particular street typology, and it drew the site plan more towards a parkway or an elongated park as perhaps a more appropriate way to give something back to the neighborhood, provide a more natural green setting that would in turn screen a parking structure that's between 50 to 100 feet back from Valley View and also conceal what are existing and operational service um, areas to the existing buildings. Yeah, that's helpful for me, Mr. Pachati, I'm sure for everyone else too. Um, Director Teague, uh, how would this plan, this proposed development plan have to change to uh, garner your approval? Oh boy, I don't know if I could design <laughs> at this point um, specific recommendations. All right. Well, yeah, I'm not going to put you on the spot that way, but uh, if you give that some thought, and when we come back in two weeks, maybe you can give us your thoughts because you did you did indicate uh, uh, in, in some of your correspondence some of the things that you thought were appropriate about it. So. Okay, did that trigger any uh, further questions? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Councilmember Jackson. Yes, this is a question from Mr. Pachati. Um, I believe it was Mr. Theme brought up the uh, iconic um, wanting to have something that's innovative. And I was going down 66th Street the other day, and the buildings that are there and the, the site, it's, it's, the bu buildings are very beautiful. And when you approach this site, either from the east going on 66th or the south coming, or from the north coming down Valley View Road, what is the view of those buildings going to be look like? And how do you, um, how would you describe those as sort of a gateway to the whole project? Um, I, I had a hard time visualizing what that would be like. And if you've got any pictures, that'd be great. Yeah, um, Andy, if while we're answering that question, I could ask you to um, to bring up some of the renderings, particularly the aerial view hovering over Roslyn Park, and we can also look at the view of the mid-rise 13-story um, housing building. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I want to put this in the context of where we're at with building design specifically. Um, the development team certainly sees and validates the import of this site as a gateway or threshold moment to sites further south along France Avenue. The building designs that you're seeing 
are in compliance or as close as we feel um, we can be relative to the material selections and transparencies in the design experience guidelines. They are not yet final designs, which would come on their own for future approval prior to more design and construction of those projects. The 13-story mid-rise housing building um, is intended to have a featured element looking north. It's being shown as sort of a vertical accent fin or blade at this juncture to really signify that that's a moment of entry into the Southdale district on that particular uh, facade. That building steps back as one goes vertically, um, creating different layers and types of outdoor terraces and balconies for the, for the housing building. So the intent is for it not to appear as a singular building from the ground to the top, but along that 13 stories to subdivide the scale with different green roof and plaza elements. If I reference the intersection of Valley View and 66, there, there would be an on-grade plaza that speaks to the relationship of, to Roslyn Park um, north uh, west of the site. I think, Andy, if you can just wand over the plaza there um, at the corner. That would be an access point that would allow folks that are using the district parking in the parking structure, particularly for Roslyn Park events, fireworks and so forth, to have a welcoming plaza at that corner and then the low-rise housing at six stories would then, from a pedestrian scale, completely obscure the parking structure beyond. Any follow-on, Councilmember Jackson? No, thank you. That answered my question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, Member Pierce. I, I do. I did like your um, question for uh, Director T, but uh, in a broader sense, I think um, we've seen, uh, we've we've received feedback. We've heard it tonight in the the uh, public hearing as well, and it's this concept of guidelines versus standards. Uh, we heard the word standards used a few times. Um, and so I think the, it's not just nomenclature, right? Guidelines versus standards. I do think that the way we are describing um, these projects and guidelines, there's a risk to me that we could continue to have projects that come through that may not meet the guidelines. And Mr. McIntosh tried to quaff that by, you know, saying the spirit of a guideline. <laughs> Um, which I appreciate, but I do think there's something in there that if we have a set of guidelines that we expect to be used as principles around how we might develop a site versus these are standards that we absolutely need to meet. Um, I think there's something in there in terms of us uh, as a, a council um, really understanding what the intent is there. Um, and so understanding what we what staff might think um, changes could be made for this project to garner some more approval. It was 7-0, right, in denial. That would help me in starting to understand more of how we want to apply guidelines um, to this particular project and even future projects. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Pierce. Uh, Mr. Pichotti? Yeah, if I just may, Mr. Mayor, make a, a quick point. I um, want to thank and affirm Councilmember Pierce for the, the point about the guidelines versus standards. And um, I want to assure Council that the development team has looked at and scrutinized the design experience guidelines in a lot of detail. And so when there's discussion about meeting the spirit, if there is any element that isn't in exact compliance, um, there are point-by-point -point analyses that have been done, one of which was shared with you this evening, 
why a different component was proposed. So the design team and the development team would very much welcome um, dialogue in specifics about where some things are applied and not applied. And one final point, if I may, there's a lot of detail in the design experience guidelines, and they take on sort of a collective memory that um, then sometimes isn't always accurate. For example, the notion of the 200 foot by 200 foot block as a standard, the illustrations in the guidelines do not indicate that as a standard on this site. To the credit of the guidelines, if one looks at those illustrations, the presence of the existing buildings and their unusual geometries, the illustration and the guidelines embrace that and indicate another non 200 foot by 200 foot pattern on this particular site. I only mention that as one example because we do affirm the guidelines and have taken them very seriously. Um, there are point by point metrics that sometimes are different from what a collective recollection is. And we'd love to have that discussion in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Picciotti. Uh, Director Teague? Yeah, if I might add, the, the design experience guidelines aren't intended to be standards. It's really intended to start the discussion, to be a tool that we use to evaluate is there enough here when looking at the guidelines to justify an increase in density? So there, it's always going to be somewhat subjective. Um, it's a tool that we didn't have five years ago, so we're, we're in a better place when reviewing these types of projects in that we do have aspirations that we're trying to achieve. But I don't believe we're going to meet you know, we can't meet all of the guidelines. Again, it's intended to start to have discussions like this. Is there enough here to justify allowing the increase in density using this tool um, and evaluating those guidelines? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's well put and helpful. Uh, it, it just seems to me that with what we've heard tonight that a question that at least I need to think about, and I think the rest of us do too, is as we look at these projects uh, in the South Hill District, and particularly along France Avenue, and, and think about in our own minds the potential evolution of that street, uh, are there projects that partially adopt the design principles? Um, okay. Uh, should we be satisfied making incremental steps towards the total capturing of that vision that I think Mr. McIntosh correctly stated was something that we intended to try to do over a 50 year period of time. So if, if we wait for the market to catch up with our design uh, principles, our design experience guidelines, I should say, how long will these buildings along France Avenue sit the way they are? these 50, 60 year old buildings that are ripe for redevelopment. And that's something I need to think through as we contemplate what we're going to do individually on our votes uh, two weeks from now. You know, did they, did they capture a sufficient amount of the uh, guideline experience to justify, as Director Teague says, the density that they're proposing? And is the incremental step they're proposing something that is satisfactory to us? And as I think Mr. Nelson said, sort of sets the tone along with the U.S. Bank project of uh, future development along France Avenue or, or would encourage it, or are we going to discourage it? That's, that's something to be thinking about as well. So, uh, Member Pierce, thanks for raising that issue so that we got that answer from Director T. Uh, anything else? All right, so um, we talked about keeping this matter open uh, for public testimony for a bit longer. And uh, I think the motion I would entertain that we should consider, uh, someone should make it, is to close the public hearing at noon on January 13th, 2021, and continue action on uh, this matter uh, to the January 20, 2021 City Council meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So 
I'll move. Member Staunton moves. I'll second. Member Jackson seconds. All right, we've got a motion and a second to close the public hearing at noon on January 13th, 2021 on this uh, proposed uh, project at uh, 6600 6800 France Avenue uh, and to continue the action on the item until our January 20, 2021 City Council meeting for determination. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, Clerk, Clerk Allison. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. Motions approved. All right, and uh, just a reminder, folks, then, uh, if you want to provide further uh, commentary, uh, any um, position you want to take, uh, thoughts you want to share with the council, you need to get it done by January 13th, 2021. And you can do it through the uh, bettertogetheredina.org website or call in uh, to City Hall, and we'll put you into the uh, correct voicemail box. All right, uh, Manager Neal, I think uh, our Economic Development Director, Bill Noondorf, has the next matter. I didn't know if you had any preliminary comment with respect to this potential emergency regulation around third-party food service delivery fees or not, but I thought I'd better go to you first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Yes, just a couple of things. Um, we have been uh, interacting with our local business community, small business community, in fact, throughout the pandemic and trying to find ways that we could uh, positively impact them uh, through our regulatory system uh, or through our, our CARES money and, and other ways. Uh, this is a way, and, and we have done that um, and many times uh, over the past year. Uh, this action tonight is one that uh, Mr. Neuendorf has uh, been a strong advocate for and has had some discussions with the restaurant community. It is, uh, is, it is a uh, proposal that has been um, uh, taken from, uh, exactly from uh, what the city of Minneapolis did a couple, of, uh, a couple of weeks ago and what other communities are doing around the country. So with that, uh, I'd like Mr. Neuendorf to explain this a little bit more and um, how it would be impacted, how it would be implemented, how it would be enforced. Great, yes, thank you. Uh, Bill Neundorf, the city's economic development manager. Uh, Mayor and council members, uh, uh, this proposed emergency regulation does address a problem as manager Neal described. Uh, and the problem potentially threatens the viability and, and continued operations of restaurants in Edina. Um, uh, this problem was first brought to our attention in early summer months back in May, June, July. Uh, when consumers chose to order and have takeout food delivered uh, more often due to these COVID-19 health and safety concerns. Uh, and as many folks know, there's a variety of third-party vendors out there that provide a convenient tool for customers uh, who, prefer to, who prefer to order their food from the restaurants. Uh, these vendors offer online portals that customers can then use on their phones or their, or their computers. Uh, the type of vendors include uh, popular ones like Grubhub, DoorDash, Bite Squad, and several others. Uh, many consumers find these types of services very convenient, but we've learned that many consumers are not aware that the local restaurants pay an exceptionally high commission to participate on these third-party platforms. These commissions erode with the revenue restaurants need to stay in business. Uh, after talking with a, a, a few restaurant operators in Edina, we've learned that they typically pay a commission between 20 to 40% of the fee. So for example, a restaurant that sells a $13 hamburger platter would only receive $9 uh, when, they, when it's ordered through this third party vendor. Um, by comparison, if the restaurant uh, would receive a full price, if a consumer orders the food directly and, and stops in for curbside pickup. Uh, these behind the scenes commissions are in addition to a relatively small convenience fee that is seen by the, by the consumer. Um, these types of high commissions are especially concerning under these pandemic conditions when consumer patterns are changing rapid, rapidly, uh, when government orders limit how these restaurants can, 
can remain in operation. Um, uh, so this uh, proposed emergency regulation has two essential elements. Uh, first, this would establish a 15% cap on the basic commission charged to restaurant operators, far below the existing amounts of 30 to 40%. But we would still allow a third party vendor to provide additional services like advertising, marketing, prioritization, et cetera, at an additional cost to the restaurant, but it would be optional rather than mandatory. Second, this ordinance or this regulation would require the third party vendors to give the consumer an itemized receipt that clearly identifies not just the cost of their food and beverage, but also identifies the taxes that are paid, the service fees charged, and commissions that are charged behind the scenes. With complete information available to them, the consumer can then make an informed decision when they patronize our local businesses in the future. Um, if you've read through this uh, emergency regulation in any detail, you may have noticed that the terminology used uh, differs slightly from some of the terms that we typically use here in Edina. Um, uh, in this case, city staff and our city attorneys strongly recommend that we use the precise same language that was recently adopted by the city of Minneapolis. The choice of wording provides consistency, consistent regulations for these third party vendors, consistent procedures for our local restaurants, and a consistent and transparent experience for the customer. Um, uh, it, uh, to to um, add on to a question that manager Neil had asked, how do we enforce this? It's tough to enforce. I'll be very frank about that. Um, the city does not intend to go running down and checking receipts from the third party providers every time you order a meal. Um, so enforcement would be on a complaint basis. Um, so if a restaurateur uh, is being overcharged uh, in violation of our regulation, the city could then follow up using, using the means available to us uh, in state statute. Um, so enforcement is gonna be a challenge, but um, we've learned that several other cities across the United States uh, have implemented similar regulations, especially in, the, in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And our staff does recommend that we move forward and approve this emergency order. Um, I'm happy to answer, answer any other questions. Uh, City Attorney Kendall is also on the line who prepared and reviewed and then prepared again the, the, uh, the language. We're happy to stand for your questions. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Neuendorf. Uh, questions for Mr. Neuendorf? Yes, Member Jackson. So if it's an enforcement on a complaint basis, um, can a restaurant be one of the complainers to have this enforced? Or does it have to be a consumer? Uh, we're expecting the complaints would be filed by the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Member Stoughton. Any um, evidence about what the fees were before the pandemic? Uh, no, I, I first learned of the higher fees uh, this summer. I did not inquire in the past. Uh, it was noted um, after restaurants reopened, uh, after the spring closure, um, the use of these third party apps really started to skyrocket. So, um, I'm not sure what the fees were in the past, but it really rose to the, uh, really got the attention of the operators this summer. So they're telling you, the restaurant owners are telling you that the fees are higher than they used to be? Uh, what they're telling me, uh, council members, is that the fees are high. I didn't inquire about past practices. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Member Staunton has raised an important one, I think. Timing on this, Mr. Neundorf, I mean, this is an interesting question. And we know they're under, uh, under great financial duress here. We're trying to figure out ways to help them. Um, as you investigated this matter, then would you, would you please comment for us on why you, why you think uh, it's important to be doing this? Sure, I, I think it's. I think the timing is very important. Um, 
uh, Attorney Kendall and I had discussed different ways to implement something like this, but we did note that this should be done on a temporary basis. Uh, it is unusual for a city to inject ourselves into a contract between two private parties, a restaurant and a, and a delivery operator. Um, but under these uh, emerging emergency conditions that exist in our state, this is one of those rare times where this type of interaction might be appropriate. Um, uh, I believe time is of the essence. We could debate this. We could look at it for another couple months. But the the facts that, that I'm hearing from the restaurants is that um, you know the, the the stress and the duress is now. Um, so the way we worded this is that this regulation would be in effect through only throughout the duration of these emergency orders. Once that's lifted, this regulation would disappear. It is just temporary. So if the governor, uh, if the governor uh, says that restaurants can reopen at 50% occupancy, does that impact this at all? No, no, this would remain in, in effect as long as there's any kind of emergency government orders in effect in Edina or the state of Minnesota. All right. And that the, by that question, I wasn't meaning to in, in, intimate that there could be a reduction in the number of products ordered uh, online from restaurants just because they can now be open at some level of full capacity. Um, but their financial circumstances might improve. So that's why I thought Member Staunton's question was really interesting. You know, is it is it just that they're feeling the pinch from everything now because they've had to be closed? Uh, are these prices different than they were before? Uh, all uh, interesting, but we certainly see uh, we've experienced ourselves ways that we can help relieve stress for our small businesses and particularly our restaurant operators. And this is another way to think about it, I guess. Member Staunton, as a uh, city attorney yourself, are you comfortable with this? <laughs> That's not my job on Tuesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Mr. you were Kendall's comfortable with that. You're just going to stay on mute when I. <laughs> I'll I'll move approval. There you go. Is there a second? Second. Second. Yeah. All right. We've got a uh, motion and a second motion by Member Staunton, second by Member Anderson. I think it was uh, to adopt local emergency regulation twenty twenty one dash oh one, which um, would impose a cap on third party food service delivery fees during the COVID nineteen emergency. Any further discussion on the proposed uh, adoption of that regulation? All right, roll call, please. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovlin. Aye. The motion approving the emergency regulation 2021-01, imposing a cap on third party food service delivery fees during the COVID-19 emergency is approved. And now uh, we're on to Manager Neal and the uh, appointment of an acting mayor or mayor pro tem from the old days, but now acting mayor. Yep, we do, we use both terms, but I think the, the, the current term is acting mayor. So thank you, your honor. Uh, it is necessary, it's important and necessary for the city to have an acting mayor uh, appointed. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Uh, this position has traditionally been held by the, the council member with the most senior uh, tenure. Uh, for the last eight years, it was held by Mary Brindle in, in that role. Uh, what we do need to uh, codify this action is a, is a motion and a majority vote of the council. This has been the practice uh for as long as I've been on the council of having 
the most senior council member act as the acting mayor, and that would be uh, Kevin Staunton. And so um, either I would make the motion or somebody else could make the motion with regard to council member Staunton. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll move that uh, Member Staunton be uh, named Mayor Pro Tem, our acting mayor. All right. And that is by calendar year, Member Anderson. That's for 2021. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion uh, recommending the appointment of Kevin Staunton as the acting mayor for calendar year 2021. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second by Member Pierce. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Council Member Anderson? Aye. Council Member Jackson? Aye. Council Member Pierce? Aye. Council Member Staunton? Aye. Mayor Hovlin? Aye. Member Staunton is appointed acting mayor for 2021. Thank you for agreeing to serve, Member Staunton. And you're not missing any meetings this year. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite commentary that after six years, I'm the senior council member on the council. <laughs> fresh, fresh faces. <laughs> All right, uh, Manager Neal, we've got some things to talk about relative to the uh, other organizations that we uh, serve the city of Edina on. Uh, there's the Southwest Cable Commission, the Noise Oversight Committee for the MAC. There's a school partnership, uh, Edina Ed uh, Advisory Board, the Ida 494 Corridor Commission, the 169 Corridor Coalition. I'll turn this over to you so you can talk about some of the uh, external, as you call it, external council roles and appointments, and we'll look for some volunteers. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the city is a num is is a member uh, of a number of outside organizations uh, that do city government work, uh, advocacy work, etc. Uh, the big ones that we're involved in, of course, are the League of Minnesota Cities, Metro Cities, and the Municipal Legislative Commission. We don't have uh, defined uh, council members that are representing the city to those organizations, with the with the exception of the Municipal Legislative Commission in which uh, the mayor and the city manager represent the city to that organization on their board of directors. And in fact, uh, Mayor Hovland is the chair of that board of directors uh, at the MLC right now. And has been for a long time. Uh, you've been the chair there for a long time, haven't you? Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> people people are just uh, letting you, letting Keep you be. Keep looking around there. thinking, hey, where's the next uh, person? <laughs> Where's Mike McGuire at? Huh? Um, anyway, uh, we have a, a number of organizations that I laid out in, in for you in the council packet, but really gave you a little bit more uh, context in terms of the demand uh, for these organizations. Southwest Cable Commission is a cable as a kind of cable television consortium meets twice a year. Uh, the Noise Oversight Committee. Uh, we, uh, Councilmember Brindle has represented us uh, to that group since we got a seat on that group, um, and I laid out their their uh, schedule as well. The only one that I had proposed to you in the packet that we are not a member of um, has been the 169 Coalition. We're not currently a member of. Uh, we've we've kind of gone back and forth. Uh, we our membership in that group has we've been a member and not been a member. We're currently not a member. But we are in the I-494 Quarter uh, Coalition, uh, the Dyna Community Ed Advisory Board. Uh, uh, Council Member Staunton represents us on that board. I, I wasn't, a, I'm not sure what the scale of the in, uh, involvement is there. So I, if you wanted to comment on that, that would be helpful. Uh, the Edina, uh, City of Edina, Edina Public School Partnership. Uh, this is re something relatively new. It's been in place for uh, a little more than a year uh, in the first, well, almost two years actually. In the first year, uh, we met uh, we met uh, twice during the year. This last year, of course, during the uh, pandemic, uh, it's been more difficult to uh, get schedules to match up with that group. But that has two members of the council and two members of the school board. Um, 
we don't really have uh, established uh, customs and practices as to how we uh, divide up these assignments. Uh, we, we just have a general discussion about it at, at this level and, and people plug into uh, what they think they can uh, accommodate or what they're interested in, again, based on, um, based on, based on time available. I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these as well. Yeah, Manager Neal, I, would you comment, uh, this I think would be helpful to uh, our, especially our new council members, uh, the Noise Oversight Committee I see, former council member Brindle has joined us, uh, who serves on that Noise Oversight Committee. Uh, my understanding is that that does not necessarily have to be an appointment uh, of an elected official, that uh, member Brindle could serve in that capacity uh, if the council so desired. That is correct, and we have confirmed that with the MAC. Uh, they, the members of that group really are, are kind of a combination, mostly a combination of industry folks, so people who work on the, who work for the airlines um, in one way or another for the airlines or for the MAC. There are uh, elected officials from the various impacted communities, but there's also a couple staff members who, who serve there as well. So they have confirmed for us that they would uh, they would accept an appointment of a non-elected or even non-staff member to represent the city to the noise oversight uh, commission as long as that group was as long as that person was appointed by an action of the council and then um, as a predicate to having member former member brindle indicate her uh, desire to serve uh, I would say that uh, we sh the council should know that Member Brindle has applied to be a member of the Metropolitan Airport Commission. Our district person, Katie Clark Sieben, is has uh, resigned. I don't know what the effective date was for the resignation, but there'll be a process uh, that the MAC will go through. The governor will make an appointment. But if Member Brindle, <laughs> uh, former Member Brindle, were appointed. To the MAC, then we'd have to look for someone else to serve on a noise oversight committee. But at least for now, we could satisfy uh, that need for representation uh, for the city of Edina by reappointing member, a former member Brindle, to the uh, noise oversight committee. I'll add that the current term ends at the end of June. So your action tonight. Um, should you choose to appoint me to serve on the Noise Oversight Committee, um, then uh, I my current term ends at the end of June. And so then it would be at that point that um, if I, you know, I, I don't think anybody's heard, although I've been communicating with MAC Commission Chair Rick King and the governor's office is moving through all these. There's probably a thousand appointments that the governor makes and, uh, and it's an arduous job, but they are making it through the list of appointments. And uh, when they get to this one, I don't know. But technically, technically, Katie Clark Sieben is still the commissioner in that seat until someone else is chosen. Okay. So um, she's not relieved of duty yet, um, but uh, but nonetheless, um, I would be I would be in position on the knock through the end of June, and then um, uh, and then if I choose to continue on, which I'm sure I would unless I am selected for the District C Commissioner seat, um, then then it would be just uh, to let you know that I would continue in that capacity if it is the council's wish. Member Brindle, you should also indicate that you are serving at large, as I recall, and you are the representative for a number of cities in addition to Edina, and they have had the confidence in you to ask you to represent them as well. Right, and um, in that, uh, that assignment goes for two years. 
So I'm a year and a half into um, being serving at the dais of at-large cities. So basically, cities that are adjacent to the airport have a seat on the NOC. They have a dedicated seat on the NOC. Egan, Mendota Heights, Bloomington, Richfield, Minneapolis. And cities like Edina that are not adjacent to the airport, like Apple Valley, St. Paul, Sunfish Lake, um, Invergrove Heights, um, St. Louis Park. There's a group of at-large cities. And so the at-large representatives are a group and the at-large group then every two years designates one person of that group to sit on the dais and represent the at-large cities. Good. Um, would someone care to uh, deal with this particular issue uh, first and make a motion to appoint uh, former council member Rain Brindle uh, to continue to serve on the Noise Oversight Committee of the Metropolitan Airport Commission? I will move that motion, make that motion that Thank you, Mary Jackson. Brindle be on the knock. <laughs> We have a second. Second. Okay. Number Pierce seconds that motion. And this is to serve until uh, June. What date, Mary? The end of this term is June at the end of June, 2021. All right, June 30, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion? Roll roll call, please, Clerk Alvin. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson? Aye. Councilmember Pierce? Aye. Councilmember Staunton? Aye. Mayor Hovlin? Aye. The decision is unanimous. We are recommending to the MAC the uh, continued representation of Edina and the other at-large cities on the Noise Oversight Committee of the Metropolitan Airports Commission. Uh, that's, that, that spot be held by Mayor Brindle. Thank you for dealing with that, council members. And now we got a few other things to think about. Uh, Manager Neal, what's the timing on folks letting you know if they have a particular interest in uh, serving on a particular commission here that you've got listed? Well, I, I've heard from Council Member Anderson. He had interest in serving on the uh, city school partnership. Um, I couldn't tell whether Council Member Staunton wanted to continue on the community at advisory board. Or not. I do. Okay. I do. That's that's what I've heard so far. I haven't we've had some general discussion with our new council members during their orientation about these organizations, but uh, uh, we haven't we haven't had any discussions yet about who's who really wants to do what. So, Mr. Mayor, I would be willing to continue to serve on the community ed board. I've done that since 2015. Um, we have had some conflicts recently because their meetings often are on Thursday mornings and our HRA meetings sometimes conflict with them, but it's a good group. I've enjoyed it. I'd be happy to continue serving. All right. Do we need to uh, do this by motion? Mm -hmm. Neil? Yes, we do. All, right. All the rest of them as well. Yep. All right. Is there a motion to appoint uh, council member Staunton to, uh, to continue to serve on the Edina Community Education Advisory Board. So moved. Member Jackson moves. Second. Member Anderson seconds. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovlin. Aye. Council Member Staunton is uh, reappointed to the city's position on the uh, Edina Community Education Advisory Board. Thank you, Member Staunton. Uh, there's a couple of transportation related commissions. Member Brindle has served on those as well. And then has Member Brindle been doing Southwest Cable Commission as well? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so you've really been busy with external activities. Can you give a can you give a just a kind of a brief overview, I guess, of those three, the 494, 169, and then the cable commission? Sure. 
Um, yes, uh, Council Member Pierce. Um, one sixty nine. The one sixty nine coalition we we do not belong to. I thought we did, but we don't. So that one is not on the table. The four ninety four quarter coalition. Uh, this is a group that meets and and talks about uh, transportation projects on and along uh, the I-494 corridor, including a, a massive project that's uh, that's coming up in two years. Remember, former member Brindle? Yeah, two years. Yes. You know that that whole realignment of of the uh, 35W-494 intersection is is going to be one of the biggest single construction projects in in um, in the state's history when it gets done the so th so those are the issues and we work with other cities in that regard it, it talks a lot about access to and from 494 it talks about uh, development along 494 so that's what that um, that's what that group does uh, the Southwest Cable Commission we are part of a, a consortium of five cities Richfield, Hopkins, Edina, Eden Prairie, and Minnetonka. And we jointly regulate our cable franchise uh, with, yeah. with who, you know, right now it's with Comcast. For a while, we thought CenturyLink was going to get into the game, and they did, but now they're gone. But there are issues around the regulation of cable television uh, that we all do together as a consortium. We employ a, an attorney. Uh, who who assists us in the management of this process? We meet twice a year. Uh, the board consists of the city manager from each city and an elected member from each city. Well, that sounds terribly exciting. <laughs> you don't get free cable out of the deal. But, <laughs> um, but I would, um, I'll do the 494 corridor coalition. I don't know what the time commitment is for that, but it sounds just slightly more exciting <laughs> than regulating cable TV. <laughs> <laughs> So I can tell you that the I-494 Corridor <laughs> Commission meets every month on the first when um, second Wednesday it says second second Wednesday of the month at seven thirty in the morning. Okay. And with the large project uh, on 494, and the project is. 494 airport to 169 and that includes the major interchange um, and so you would have a seat on the commission and you would also have a seat on the policy advisory committee for that project this organization employs a full-time staff member as well so there are, there is somebody that's doing sort of the administrative work behind the scenes mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity for you to meet uh council members from our adjoining cities from our neighboring cities and also representatives from mindot hey, you don't have to keep selling scott okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't sell past the sale right, okay. <laughs> right. so um is it do i understand that there are Jaws of victory here. Right? <laughs> um, there are two seats on the um, Edina Education Advisory Board. Is that correct? Uh, there and there's two members on that city's uh, school partnership. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. The city. Yeah, not the community yet. I'm sorry. The city school partnership. I I misread right. that. Yeah. So um, one's interested in that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, be the second person on that, and then I will do the Southwest Cable Communications. I'll learn about cable TV. All right. All right. So uh, just to... Unless somebody wants to beat me to it. <laughs> For Council Member Pierce, I think the, the one city that's missing from this list is, uh, I'm assuming Minnetonka is still a member. Yes. Very Yes. So it's uh, it used to be Plymouth and Maple Grove as well, but they dropped out years ago. I was on there too. I think you'll enjoy it. Okay. Um, so it's Minnetonka, uh, Eden Prairie, Edina, Bloomington, Richfield. Um, okay. So um, is there a motion to appoint uh, Council Member Pierce to the I-494 Corridor Commission? So moved. There a second. 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 
All right, second by Member Jackson. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to the appointment of Council Member James Pierce to the I-494 Corridor Commission. Council Member Anderson? Aye. Council Member Jackson? Aye. Council Member Pierce? Aye. Council Member Staunton? Aye. Mayor Hovland? Aye. James Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I move to appoint Council Member Anderson and Council Member Jackson to the School City um, Committee. You want to include that? You want to include that motion also appointing Council Member Jackson to the Southwest Cable Commission? Yes. All right. <laughs> there a second. <laughs> I think member, member Pierce is showing something else you want me to move. He's in a second. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's a second. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got um, <laughs> we got a motion to second to appoint uh, Council Member Jackson and Council Member Anderson to the Edina City School Partnership and Council Member Jackson to the Southwest Cable Commission as well. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Uh, for a point of clarification, uh, can you tell me who seconded that motion? I, I did. Pierce. Pierce. Councilmember Pierce. Thank you. Between the uh, council, council yeah, do that. Mayor, Mayor Van Valkenburg decided. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. Uh, motions approved. Thank you, folks, for agreeing to serve on those uh, uh, external roles. I have one clarification, if I may, and Go that ahead. is that I'm on the Highway 169 Corridor Coalition website, and the City of Edina is a member. Yeah, and we, we just checked it out today, and they, the, the, I think that's old. Oh, is it? Yeah. We didn't we didn't pay that invoice. <laughs> you didn't have to ask it that way, Mary. All right, all right. Well, okay. We, we chose not to continue our membership, apparently. Apparently not. Okay. Very good. All right. Um All right. Well, I will sign off because that's what I came on to participate in. All right. So, thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. All right. We are on to uh, correspondence of petitions. The thing that we need to know about that wasn't part of our virtual packet? No, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, do you have an aviation noise update, Manager Neal? I, I, I do not have an aviation uh, noise update uh, right now. I guess we let uh, former member Brindle go a little bit too early. Uh, Mayor and Council comments, and uh, I'll have Member Anderson lead off. That's great. Thank you. you. By example. Um, you know, I wanted to mention, uh, I don't know if this will come through very well on this poor light. Yeah. There was a, um, a, uh, a mailer that came out from the Public Works uh, called the Public <laughs> Works Pipeline. I'm not sure if it's Genesis. Um, but I did want to congratulate. I, I'm certain that this came from Director Benarat's team. Yep. And I uh, just want to congratulate her on that and their team because I just I, I found it to be extremely informative, straightforward, well written, well presented. And uh, I think that people will learn a lot and take some guidance from it. So I, uh, I thought that was pretty nifty. Um, then wanted also, I think, to um, just recognize Member Staunton for being senior. Um, I know that that uh, <laughs> it's been a long time coming, so congratulations on that. Uh, to welcome uh, members uh, Pierce and Jackson with open arms. Um, thanks for stepping forward, and uh, you you got through the first uh, public hearing, and so uh, that's that's significant. Um, and beyond that, uh, congratulations, Mr. Mayor, on your new term and your swearing in. You looked good in your picture today, so uh, I thought that went well. And uh, that's all I have. It did take on, I think, significance for all of us uh, when we raised that right hand and sort of pulled the Constitution mm -hmm. of the United States. Yeah. It's a special meeting in 2021. So.
Thank you for that, Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, Member Stoughton. So um, it is an interesting notion that I'm the senior council member now after six years. So those who those who say we don't have fresh uh, fresh faces on the council, uh, this is uh, evidence to the contrary. Um, I want to welcome um, Member Jackson and Member Pierce. It's great to have you on board. I'm really looking forward to great things, and I'm very excited that you're joining us to get to make all of these uh, challenging decisions about the future of our community and can't think of two better suited people for it. So welcome Thank aboard. You. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, it's good It's good to have somebody holding down the senior role at the meeting. <laughs> um, so it's, it's gonna be a great council. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you and um, and that's all I have for tonight, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Acting Mayor Sutton. Um, new Council Member Jackson. Thank you. Um, you know, in our work session tonight, we talked about the boards and commissions. And when I was preparing for that, I looked, and we've got 10 boards and commissions with nine. Uh, adult members and two to three student members each. That is a tremendous number of people who step up to serve our city. And the fact that we have to turn people away um, to fill those spots because so many people want to um, participate and to volunteer, I just that just blows me away every time. And I just wanted to acknowledge how lucky we are to live in a city with so many engaged people. And I'm, I'm really excited about people sending in their um, applications for those commissions. And, and I think it'll be really wonderful to fill them up. And, and that's just a great thing. And I'm excited to be here. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, well, we are excited to have you here as well. And uh, Council Member Pierce, and both you did just a great job tonight, incidentally. It was, uh, it just felt so comfortable having you both here. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just real quick, I um, wanted to just say uh, thank you. I'm not sure everybody who was involved, but I will say Director Benarat and Manager Neal, um, we weren't sure how the swearing in ceremony was going to go, but um, I think whoever planned that did a fabulous job of um, making that event special, um, even though it was um, under circumstances that we, we do wish we weren't under. Um, but you guys, you, you made that special and my, my family definitely um, enjoyed it. It was really cool to have um, um, Caitlin there. So my, my nine year old um, and the, you guys just made that special. So I just wanted to thank uh, you for that. And anyone else who helped plan that, please um, express my thanks to them as well. Um, sure, congratulations, um, Council Member Jackson and Mayor Hovland. It's going to be fun working with everyone. Um, and so I'm just looking forward to it. Thank you. And ditto on the thanks Great. from the Jackson family, too. That was awesome. Yeah. It was really enjoyable to see the families there yesterday. It was. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, just a, a terrific little event, appropriately distanced. Yeah. E even with the new va variant, uh, the mute, even with the new mutation, I think we were appropriately distanced. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I also appreciated tonight that uh, new council members were able to express their thoughts to our fellow residents and our colleagues and me as well uh, as to what we see for the future it's a it's a continual uh, pleasure and um, responsibility i guess to be thinking about the future of our town and where we want it to be and what kind of a town we want to see here in uh, 40 years and uh, to be thinking about as somebody told me today to be uh, contemplating planting those trees uh, whose shade will never enjoy <laughs> um, so uh, it's it's not always easy work because there's a lot of opinions to be dealt with, um, but I think we'll 
have some real interesting discussions that our council will be making collectively some very good decisions on the future of our community. We need to keep it moving forward. Um, one of the things I frankly worry about is the fact that we're not on the Southwest LRT line. I think that's, mm -hmm. I think our, our, our neighboring communities are really gonna benefit from that. And um, that's something to be mindful of. And you can't rest on your laurels. We need to be thinking about that too and keeping Edina moving ahead all the time. And uh, maybe there will come a time when we have a, a spur line here on, on rail. I don't think it'll happen anytime soon, but uh, uh, that's just one more thing I'm concerned about. Anyway, um, I don't have anything else. Uh, we've got all kinds of extra things going on. We got a nice award, Carolyn Jackson. We got, and I should look back here and find it. Um, this is an amazing award. You're going to love this, your former, From your former employer. Oh, my gosh. The Minnesota, you'll, you'll find this to be quite fascinating. I think the Municipal Legislative Commission got the Friend of the CGMC Award, the Coalition <laughs> of Minnesota Cities. Now, how about that? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Rural, rural, the greater Minnesota reaching out to the urban folks and saying, hey, thanks for being <laughs> Our well, it's well deserved, and and Mayor Hubland, your outreach to Greater Minnesota has been fantastic, and um, so just a, a quick thing behind the story. The reason Scott and the mayor and I are laughing so hard is that when I sat down for my um, uh, interview for the Energy and Environment Commission, I was working for Flaherty and Hood that represents the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And oh my gosh, did I get grilled about <laughs> local government aid. And what's the alternative to that with, where that's on the valuation? Fiscal disparities. Well, no, not fiscal disparities. It's the other thing. Well, anyways, the, I, w I was just grilled so hard. And, oh, market um, value and, homestead credit. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> market value homestead yeah, credit. Yeah. And um, and it's just a, it's a testament to uh, the leadership here that, that we, we have gotten that award because it's, it's was a there was a gap to fill. And um, and it's it's really that's awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, well, that's it. Uh, that's it for me, Manager Neil. Uh, thank you, Yonor. I have two things. Uh, first is that we are going to cancel the first HRA meeting of the year, planned HRA meeting on the 14th, uh, but we will go ahead with the meeting on the 28th. Uh, part of what you approved uh, tonight um, in the consent agenda is the mayor's appointment of council members uh, uh, Jackson and Pierce to be members of the HRA as well so they also swore in uh, they were also um, sworn in as hra members uh yesterday i also wanted you to know that we are taking a look at uh, our liquor license revenues um they uh our liquor license revenues for uh the past year have been around in to terms of total revenue around 325 thousand dollars so it's not an insignificant amount of revenue However, um, it's uh, uh, some of the some of the folks who are buying those licenses from us have not been able to operate uh, because of the executive orders. So we're taking a look at developing a proposal about how uh, that the council could consider to uh, consider rebating uh, some of those fees back to uh, eligible bars and restaurants, and we'll bring that back to you in a couple of weeks. And aside from that, that's all I have tonight. Good. Thank you. You caused me to think about one other thing I wanted to express my gratitude to the council for, and that was on the consent agenda was the annual appointment of the assistant weed inspector. Being by statute, uh, having the mayor be the chief weed inspector, I really appreciate having an assistant that I can delegate the responsibility to. So thank you for passing that motion. And uh, Tom Swenson is proud to be the assistant <laughs> inspector for the city of Edina. <laughs> Good. With pride. The good, good news is there's not much work in the winter. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, anything else? That's all we got. Um, and a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. You got a motion by Member Sutton, by Member Anderson to adjourn. Uh, any further discussion? 
A roll call, please, with respect to adjournment. Councilmember Anderson? Aye. Councilmember Jackson? Aye. Councilmember Pierce? Aye. Councilmember Staunton? Aye. Mayor Hovlin? Aye. Uh, and also a tip of the hat to member Benner or uh, director Benerot and her team for a job well done as uh, member Pierce needed. So thank you. And we stand adjourned. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.